Good evening. I'm going to check the mic before I get started again. Uh, how's everybody doing? Audio, UMC mic is working. All right, and we're going to do everything before you all vomit in your gullets a little bit. We're going to make sure that we're live everywhere. We're live on Rumble. We're live on vivabarnslaw.locals.com. And now I shall retire from your screen and play something that will make you puke in your mouths. All of them. At the same time, this will be like Scott Adams. What's it called when he does it? Aggregate moment of vomit. This is the stuff of, oh my gosh. Did he just say, he said happy pride day. I didn't, I didn't see that. Happy pride. Happy pride. The adults, no problem. Using children for divisive political propaganda. Look how nice is white. Isn't there a rule there's no white after Labor Day? Ah, no, no. Look at this. Look at this face. By the way, the kid's shirt in the back says, dude, perfect. Oh my god, that baby is going to have nightmares and she's not going to know why for the rest of that kid's life. Do, do you know what, like, Mark Twain, history doesn't repeat but it tends to rhyme? Like, you put bubbly music and it's all nice, there's a bunch of, you know, colorful images in it. What could be wrong about using children for divisive politics? Oh, I don't know. Hold on. It made me think of something else that, you know, existed once upon a time. Here, look at this. Here's another video of, you know, po politicians using children to convey political messages. I mean, it, here, at least they're getting exercise. This goes on for a full minute and a half. Well, then it, then it gets a little more sinister. No. History doesn't repeat, but it tends to rhyme. Politicians using children to push and promote divisive political propaganda is as old as time. And I mean, it's, you know, but for the fact he's wearing nice white pants, he's got nice fluffy hair, he speaks very nicely. Uh, the, uh, the, the similarities, the rhymes between the Trudeau regime and regimes of the past, uh, there are too many at this point to ignore, to ignore the, the, the similarities in the poetry. You know, they used to call it mercy killings. Now Canada calls it medical assistance in dying. Back in the olden days, they used to target the mentally ill, the handicapped, the mentally impaired. And they called it mercy killings because it was for their own benefit. We're doing it to spare them the suffering of their existence. Canada's doing it now. They just call it medical assistance in dying. And they don't want to deny the constitutional right to end one's life to people who are mentally ill and therefore incapable of uh, legal consent under some circumstances. Hey, no, they're not using the kids to promote hateful propaganda. They just parade children on stage to say how the government should cut the rights petit, petit, of those who refuse to get vaccinated. Oh, no, they're not, they're not, you know, getting them to march in line, although they're getting them to line up for parades. And it's, it's bubbly. It's nice. It's coming under the cloak of, of benevolence and tolerance and, and inclusivity. Such inclusivity that if you don't agree with the inclusivity, you will be mocked, you will be shamed, they will try to cancel you until what happened in Canada, uh, a, a teacher who got canceled for, you know, disagreeing that Canada was more racist than the States ended up taking his own life. Sweet, merciful goodness. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, we've got a hard out tonight at seven o'clock because I'm not saying I forgot that it was my kid's birthday, I just forgot that it was my kid's birthday today. So we're going to go out for dinner afterwards. And 
I need the internet to resolve a, a debate I'm having with my wife. All of our children are born in the month of July. And assuming that, you know, no one was premature and no one was very late, although one of them was a little bit late, we're trying to decide what is the date of the procreation that results in children being born in the month of July. So, internet. The children were born, the, no, no one was premature, but it, it wouldn't really matter. But if the babies are born in the month of July, what month would the act of procreation have taken place? I'll wait until I see the uh, answers in the chat. Now, it's not all going to be vomitous for the intro video. There's another one which is going to make you vomit just because, you know, th this is the level of, of the science. Holy sweet, merciful crab apples. Okay, I'm seeing October and September. I'm going to wait for more answers coming from the chat. But while we do that, speaking of science, you know, speaking of science, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, after his, um, after his marvelous appearance on the Patrick Bet David show, where we saw a full-fledged meltdown of the highest scientific order. Dude, they, they did trials, dude. They have, a, they have systems in place to make sure that, you know, like, the, the companies that are producing these highly tested, fully safe and effective uh, experimental jabs are, you know, the same, the, 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 the same companies that paid the highest criminal fines of the pharmaceutical industry. D -d Dude, well, he's coming off that epic L and, and he's going for another one. This is um, now I'm going to forget his name. But he was on our channel. He had a great sidebar. I forgot. I, I'm sorry. Anyhow, behold, the year is 2023. This is science, and this is an astrophysicist chiming in on the latest science of the day. My point is, apparently, the XXXY chromosomes are insufficient. Because when we wake up in the morning, we exaggerate whatever feature we want to portray the gender of our choice. You see, he, the scientist... The astrophysicist confounds XXXY with gender. Gender is a social construct? Okay, sex is not. So you want to grow up and say, okay, I'm going to exaggerate, exaggerate my chromosomes uh, to, to convey the gender that I want. Okay. Mm. Mm. Either mm. the one you're assigned, the, the one, one you choose to be, whatever. Are you assigned a gender? On your birth certificate, did it? I mean, I guess maybe it doesn't say gender. I think it says sex. What do I know? I haven't been born in a long time. Whatever it is. And so now, here, so, so now just to, to tie a bow on this, I, I say to it. you, say it. Somewhere I read, somewhere I, I think I read that the United States was a land where we have the pursuit of happiness. Yes. Yeah. Suppose yeah. no matter my chromosomes, today I feel 80% female. 20% male. I'm going to I'm going to put on makeup. I'm going to do that. Um, tomorrow I might feel 80% male. I'll remove the makeup and I'll wear a muscle shirt. Let's put a bow on this here, Neil. I mean, this is the question I would ask if he would ever come on for a sidebar or an interview, which I, I doubt he will. Um, if you feel 80% male and 20% female, what the hell does that mean? Let's just let's just ask that for what does that mean? I feel 80% male today. Okay. Fine. Even let's assume that we know what it means. For the individual who says, I feel 80% male and 20% female today, but tomorrow I feel 20% female and 80% male. 20% male and 80% female. Uh, do I have to call that person she the next day and he the day before? T how does that work in terms of what is demanded? I heard somewhere that it's the land of the free and you're telling me what I have to refer to you by gender? expression when you say that it can vary from one day to the next and can vary within any given day percentage wise why do you care yeah, yeah. what what why what business it is it of yours to require that i fulfill your inability to think of gender on a spectrum my point is what when did he lose his mind when did he lose his godforsaken mind when did it happen? He's got a great voice and he, he delivers with passion and gesticulation and an absolute absence of scientific reasoning or even basic logic. You're assigned a sex at your birth. It's immutable. How you identify, all right, if you think you feel X or Y on any given day, who cares? You know what the reality is? 
Nobody cared. In the best of senses, nobody cared until it came to the point where they said, I feel 80% male today. You'll refer to me as a he today. Oh, I feel 80% female today. The day after, you'll refer to me as she. You'll do it or you're a bigot. I will, I will legislate so that you are compelled to do it. You are going to be compelled to recognize my fluctuations of gender identity uh, under penalty of, in Canada, under penalty of law. Why do I care? I do not give one sweet iota of a damn in the best possible sense until such time as you say, we need to recognize this and affirm this in children. Nobody cared about drag shows. Nobody cared about drag story time. Nobody cared about strip clubs until you came and said, well, now we need to expose it to the children for their own benefit. Nobody cared until you came for the kids. Oh, but we're not coming for the kids. Oh, but now we want drag shows and drag story time at parades. We want them at school libraries. We want them for your kids. And you can't take your kids out of the programs because gender identity is a human right now. So the argument goes in Canada. And if you take your kids out of it, you are denying not only the existence, you are denying someone's human rights by saying they cannot twerk their trans drag butt in your child's face. And then we go full circle now to Justin Trudeau running around on Pride Day, shaking kids' hands and saying, hey, here's a flag. What gender are you today, little Jimmy? Oh, okay. So until Barnes gets here, let's get the rules out of the way, people. Hold on. Let me just get this one out of here. Um, you all know that these beautiful things that come in in wonderful colors called Super Chats. October, isn't that Canadian Thanksgiving? I, I think so. These beautiful things called Super Chats, YouTube takes 30% of them. Uh, we are simultaneously streaming on Rumble. Rumble has these things called Rumble Rants. They typically take 20%. Except for the end of 2023, they're taking 0%. 100% of the Rumble Rants goes to the creators. Next year, they'll take their 20%. And if the investment works as it should, there will be more people on the platform. They will have brought more people in. And for 2023, they will have benefited the creators so that in 2024, they will have increased their market share, thus also benefiting themselves because it is a business that needs to survive. Needs to survive for the betterment of humanity. Um... What else was there? No medical advice, no legal advice, no election fortification advice. For those of you who are new to the channel, welcome. The way we do things, we start on YouTube, Rumble, and vivabarnslaw.locals.com. And after about 20, 30 minutes on YouTube, we end on YouTube, go exclusively to Rumble and vivabarnslaw.locals.com. I put the entire stream up on YouTube afterwards or highlights on Viva Clips. Oh, I haven't posted a Viva Clips in a long time. Um, and that's it. All right, let me read some more super chats until Robert gets here. A two four nine six four one zero five. I know there's a there's a symbol in there that I just affirmed by reading it. Winston Def. I'm no. I don't even want to. I don't. I want to keep the bad juju out of the air. But yes, no. Winston. Uh, he does not have opposable digits, so he he did not do anything illegal. Uh, what do we got here? Mark Judetti. Judetti. Viva, how much longer do we have to pretend these people are stained before society wakes up and puts them in the loony bin where they belong? Uh, without affirming that, people are free to be um, neurodivergent. Is that, the, I mean, is that the, the, I think that literally is a word that, that is going around these days. Um, once upon a time, gender dysphoria, legit gender dysphoria was and is recognized by the DSM, whatever we're at now, DSM-5. Uh, and, and the irony was and is that discrimination on the basis of mental illness has always been illegal in Canada. I suspect it's the same in the United States. So the idea that people suffering from genuine bona fide gender dysphoria uh, would suffer any discrimination in Canada was already protected by law. Where it has gone batshit crazy is that what was once a tenth of a percent of the population suffering from a diagnosable, diagnosed you know, legit criteria mental illness has become a social contagion. And anybody who finds that um, assessment offensive, open your flipping eyes. It has become a social contagion. What was the latest stat where like 30% of um, Brown University identifies non-binary non or LGBTQ2IA+. To claim that this is not a social contagion is to absolutely um, shut your eyes to reality. Some people will say the, straw, the steel man argument, People feel liberated now to truly express their inner inner beings. This is social contagion in as much as emo was once a social fad, in as much as bell bottoms and 
Afros were once a, for a fad. As much as like punk rock leather jackets was a fad, the only difference, this is a social contagion that literally leaves scars. Being promoted by people who have now been elevated in society, not through accomplishments of their own, but through claims of discrimination uh, that have been fabricated out of whole cloth. All right. Simulant, if I can be male or female, then why can't Pluto be a planet? So, no, I, I made a joke, um, another one. To, let me just make sure that Barnes has the... Um, <laughs> I'm sure I sent it to him. You've got the link, comma, right? Question mark. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson put out another tweet. Oh, let, let, let me bring it up because it's just it, it illustrates the patent absurdity of the world in which we're living. You're born XX, you're born XY, and then he goes on to say you're assigned... You're assigned a gender at birth. No, you're not assigned a gender. You have a sex, an immutable sex at birth. It will never change throughout your life, however you feel. But as an adult, you want to do things to your body? More power to you. Nobody cares in the best possible way. The only time anybody ever cared is when you started coming for children, uh, promoting this among children, and carrying out what is nothing less than human experimentation, and genital, genital, genital mutilation on children. Here, this is Tyson chiming in on the um, recent UFO. Here, oh, they call it UAPS, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Syndrome. I don't know what the syndrome is, the S is, but so he's chiming in with something that I said when I was uh, breaking down that whistle, that whistleblower's testimony. Uh, yes, we found non-human biologics on that uh, craft. Yeah, so an unidentified aerial phenomenon, a UFO, an un unidentified flying object, is not necessarily extraterrestrial. It's not necessarily even out of this earth. It could be it's unidentified. That's what it means. This guy comes out and says, oh, she, the, the woman asks, the pilots, were they human? And this guy conveniently uh, ignores the question and says, well, we found non-human biologics on the aircraft or on the, on the vessels, whatever it was. And I said at the time, that means nothing more than it could have been a dog or a monkey in a Chinese or Russian spacecraft. They haven't identified it and it's non-human biologics because the guy did not refer to the non-human biologics as the pilot conveniently. Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist. To be clear, all animal, plant, and microbial life on Earth minus humans constitutes non-human biologics. Oh, that's interesting. What if a human identifies as an animal and thus claims that they do not have human biologics or that he, she is non-human biologics? Who are you to presume someone's biologics? How dare you suggest a human cannot be biologic fluid? That's how science works these days. It's, it's once you've abandoned science and critical thought and critical reasoning, um, or once you apply critical thought and critical reasoning to the absence of scientific thought, this is where it goes. I'm sorry, uh, 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 an XX can identify as a XX, as a boy, and an XY can identify as a girl. All right, good. And then you ha and then you have to treat them as though they are that which runs contrary to their actual biologics. Hey, who are you to presume that they have human biologics? All right, here, let's get the, let's get these uh, super chats here. Isn't this the same guy that would no longer allow Pluto to identify as a planet? <laughs> okay, I got to go check that up. I think that might be a joke that I've been uh, that I've been missing. Neil deGrasse lost his mind, especially outside his area of specialty, a long time ago, and he is clueless that he is damning himself more than ever, whomever. That is from Pasha Moyer. And then we got a, a a red Viking sticker, super sticker. Thank you very much. Now let me let me let me until Barnes gets here. Let me um on the menu tonight. Oh, hold on. Let me, let me get the menu open. Florida versus Disney. I'm going to ask Barnes the question that I asked on Twitter. If DeSantis, who by all accounts has run for the candidacy of the GOP, is over. If he not doesn't bend over and apologize, if he graciously bows out and then endorses Trump, can he salvage the political goodwill that I, that I as much as I like him, I moved to Florida because I like his politics by and large, some stuff I disagree with. Can he salvage the political goodwill that I that I recognize that he lost? Uh, we bought, we got a bunch of other good stuff. And then I'll get to some of the, well, let's just do it very quick. Like uh, we got Crazy Guru one says, hi, Viva, and thanks. Crazy Guru, good to see you again. Marty Smith, fan. Viva, my son was conceived out, uh, and born. That's pretty. Okay. <laughs> and then we got conception between mid-September, there you go, and mid-November. 
the reason why I ask is Marion and I, my wife, we celebrate our anniversary. We're, we were married in September. So I'm putting together some math there, but she keeps telling me I'm off on the math. I'll tell you, what, what does a woman know? I identify as a woman now. I know what a woman's reproductive cycle is like. Okay, Barnes, bringing you in here. Three, two, one. Booyah, sir. How goes the battle? Uh, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you. We, we're going to have to make a new shirt that says, okay, okay, Robert. Holy crap. Okay. Now, so but just so everybody knows we're going to go, we're going to go exclusive to rumble to locals at about maybe, I don't know, 20, 20 to seven, because I, I got to go for dinner. Otherwise I'm going to get into big, big trouble. Robert, what do we have on the menu? I got through the first two. Um, you want to do it quick, 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 quick. We got the, Oh, sure. Oh. I mean, we got, uh, uh, well, you may have uh, Disney, uh, the state Disney. You know, versus uh, Florida, uh, the drag queen, uh, story time case in Montana. Uh, school books, the book ban in Texas, uh, the on on libraries, sexually explicit books, uh, the Devin Archer case or matter, the Hunter Biden plea deal, uh, the sort of the big story of the week, RFK and uh, denial of Secret Service protection by the Biden administration, uh, the Iranian political prisoner case, which is really kind of fascinating, a legal amnesty case to remind people how difficult amnesty actually is to get in America. Uh, the UFO whistleblower, uh, mm -hmm. the Newberg Four, uh, three of them were released. Uh, the Nigel Farage debanking matter that's now taking on new meaning uh, relates to a case that I have against U.S. Bancor and the Facebook files. Okay, so we're going to start. We'll do the Disney uh, versus Florida here. Then we're going to end and go over to Rumble and VivaBarnesLaw.locals.com. Robert, you saw that I got the kid to say it. And he delivered it like a champ. Yes, um, yes, yeah. We, we got to put that like, uh, you know, like beginnings or end or something like that of the different video, like video clips, you know, have him. It's, absolutely. The funny thing is he's, he he got a brain fart where he forgot the law. He was just going to VivaBarnes.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, Robert, you, you need it. I keep reading the, the lawsuit. I keep reading the articles and my brain goes into the same type of uh, freeze as it does when you send me stuff about gerrymandering. So the, the basis of the lawsuit or the basis of the dispute, you're going to have to flesh this out and summarize it in terms that people can understand. They, they created a district under the law that governs the Disney, the land that Disney owns so that they can basically impose their own police. They govern their own property. They can have all sorts of stuff that would otherwise be reserved exclusively for government properties, municipalities. Um, and I think this is about where I, I lose it. Now, the, 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 the council had come to some sort of agreement with Disney that had these terms of, of, of that I don't understand, Robert, and I can't understand it. Summarize what's going on and so that we can get to the the the, the court order that we're going to discuss. So, yeah, I mean, the, the for those who want a deeper dive of this, the best uh, breakdown is by legal mindset. Uh, we'll, we'll probably have him on a sidebar at some point uh, where because he used to do a lot of this special legislative district uh, representation in the state of Florida. So it's a topic that he knows very well. And he has been the best uh, explainer of all of these otherwise tricky concepts to those unfamiliar with this unique uh, subspecies of law. Bottom line is way back, Disney was going to create his own community, uh, sort of a dream community. Uh, and it was on those grounds that he was given extraordinary, uh, the Disney Corporation was given extraordinary powers. It, that never happened because Walt Disney died. And the Disney Corporation never followed up with it and instead used it as a personal piggy bank and political protection racket for their own self-interest. And that finally ran out of political protection when they decided to uh, rail against the don't so the so-called don't say gay bill, which was basically kindergarten teachers shouldn't be giving sex ed classes to six year olds. Um, and they decided to wage war like they have in their films. And the net effect of it was, you know, the governor DeSantis, you know, envisioning his presidential run, of course, at the time, apparently, uh, but saw a good political opportunity in it. And there was just legitimate, honest outrage throughout the state of Florida that Disney ever had these special perks to begin with. And were now using their power to try to stop uh, legislation that was really very practical, pragmatic, and very popular legislation to keep schools, public schools, only teaching what matters to public schools, uh, not things out that are more within the parental duty and obligation. 
And so the uh, the the legislature formed, and they decided to create a new independent district to get rid of all of the old districts, including the Disney district. And uh, we're not Disney was no longer going to be able to handpick the people who ran that district the way they were able to do before. Usually, these special legislative districts were governed by residents because Disney never created any real residents. Its so-called residents were basically itself. So they had always been kind of abusing the process and definitely the original intention. So uh, once that law was going to go into force, uh, Disney decided, well, they're going to circumvent that law by creating their own special contracts with their pre-existing board, the board that hadn't yet been replaced but was due to be replaced, uh, to try to basically lock into perpetuity until you know somebody related to the king 21 years from whatever rule against perpetuity dies. Uh, and basically say, screw you, the state of Florida. Uh, the state of Florida, the independent commission got together and said these contracts that were signed by the old commission, commission were invalid, void ab initio. And the state legislature also stepped in and said these, we're not going to recognize these kind of, this attempt at circumventing what is, these legislative districts are subspecie of the state. So they're like, we govern this. Disney doesn't get a chance to govern this. And uh, so Disney filed suit in federal court, uh, hoping to get one of the judges that hates DeSantis and is on the left. They did, but that judge ultimately reluctantly disqualified himself because it turned out relatives owned Disney stock. Um, and he said it wouldn't be because of his obvious bias, which there's no better evidence of the problems of our judicial recusal system than a judge like that doesn't recognize his bias uh, and the appearance of it. And so, but Disney was uh, the state responded by filing suit in state court. And while the case in federal court was saying, look, the state's violating our right to contract, the state's violating our First Amendment rights. And there's big problems in those cases because you have this Disney has no right in the first place to the privileges they were given. But putting that aside, the state uh, sued in, in state court saying these contracts were void because they didn't even follow the right publishing notice and comment requirements. And they couldn't because they would have got caught earlier. So Disney moved to dismiss the proceedings in state court on grounds that or at a minimum stay them on grounds that they had sued first in federal court. And so that federal court had priority. Uh, the state moved to dismiss the federal court proceedings because they said the state court proceedings take precedence because if they win on their arguments, it moots almost all of Disney's arguments. So the state court made a ruling this week and the state court denied Disney's motion to dismiss, saying, look, you decided not to seek federal court permission as to whether or not these contracts were valid. You just assumed they were, number one. Number two, uh, the... Whether or not the contracts are valid is the entire basis of the federal court claim. And this federal court doesn't even have jurisdiction over that claim. Only the state court does. And third, under a, a range of doctrines called abstention, it's when a federal court stays out of a case while a state court resolves it. And there's one called Younger abstention, another one called Pullman extension. There's a whole bunch of them. I've managed to litigate all of them in one capacity or another, believe it or not. The... Uh, the, the federal court should probably wait for the state court to decide whether there's any contracts to adjudicate at all, because maybe they're void of an issue uh, because Florida's they couldn't follow. Disney couldn't follow it without getting caught. They didn't follow the prerequisites for how that kind of committee can pass a binding contract, because, again, it's a subspecie of a state. Disney ran it like an extension of the Disney Corporation, but legally it never was. Uh, and so now it probably what's going to happen is the state court's going to take priority. State's court's probably going to rule in the state's favor. And despite all the legal eagles of the world, Disney is going to get its rear whooped and in a big way. And credit in this case to how the state has handled this, whether it's the attorney general's office or DeSantis's people, they have done a very good job litigating this case. So it says it, it says the district, which is the tourist district or the tourism district, alleges that Disney controlled its own district thingy thing that you described. Disney drafted these agreements, caused them to be ad adopted that would allow them to retain control notwithstanding, um, notwithstanding its state legislation, Robert. Why would this be a federal case in the first place? Uh, they, a constitution. They allege First Amendment violations. Okay. All right, now, so, 
Now, so there, the Fed, the, is probably because he was trying to politically parlay this, probably said some things that maybe weren't, you know, from a legal perspective, well advised. Uh, that Disney could claim they were being targeted for discriminatory purposes by official state action. Uh, of course, they can't prove that of the legislature, not at scale. And uh, I don't think they have a First Amendment claim because what taken away from them, they were never entitled to in the first place. But uh, that was their 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 uh, thin rail to get into federal court. OK, that's interesting. Now, this is why I'm reading from the lawsuit again. It says in its federal suit, Disney takes the position that these impugned agreements were valid. So they're saying the agreements are valid, valid at the at the state level, and thus the sanctions were First Amendment violations. So the valid contracts uh, were violated by constitutionally offensive uh, conduct. Therefore, the federal. So is is which one gets stayed? Then the federal is going to get stayed pending a resolution as to whether or not these as to whether or not these the contracts state court's were valid. marching onward. So the state court's not staying anything, and it's going to move forward. So it'll be up to the federal court whether it will w w wait for the state court or not. I assume it would. Uh, that would be the reasonable thing to do. It might try to march on in an overt political battle. But what it reflects is that, that Disney believes they have far more political protection in federal court than state court, even though Disney's own contracts, as the state court mentions, chooses the state court as its preferred jurisdiction. It just re Here's the other thing that's the backstory. Federal courts almost never deal with state legislative districts. This particular state court deals with them all the time. So they know that Disney's claims are going to really – Disney knows that a someone who understands legislative districts, these independent districts, or legislatively created special districts, uh, knows that they, they didn't follow the rules and they're not going to win. So that's why they needed a politically prejudiced federal court to intervene on their behalf. I don't know who the new judge is that's been appointed to the case after the prior judge recused. The right thing to do would be to stay the case waiting for the state court to decide if there is even valid contracts in the first place. That doesn't happen. You have a biased federal court trying to protect Disney at the expense of DeSantis. Well, I mean, it seems like it violates a fundamental principle of, of procedure that you could have two mutually incompatible judgments. If the federal court says constitutional violation where the state court says contract null, null, null ab initio. Well, technically, the federal court is not being asked to address whether the contract is valid or not. So... The federal court could rule, yeah, the contract that the actions violated U.S. constitutional law, but the state court could say that couldn't be possible because there were no contracts valid in the first place, because they're claiming certain legislation that sought to uh, attack their contracts is was the targeting. Problem is that legislation only applies to valid contracts. The contracts, in fact, were void, doesn't apply to Disney. Uh, so the, but yes, you're right. The, that because of that, the federal court should wait for the state court's resolution and disposition of it, and then and well, then then Disney's on the clock. There's Disney is going to uh, likely to lose this case. So anybody out there making a a bet on it or an investment on it, uh, assume that within a year Disney loses. But I would say 80, 85 percent chance Disney loses. Okay, I drove I drove by Orlando on the way home and I uh, said I'm not the idea of stopping at Disney. Have you ever taken so, the was, kids, kids uh, to Disney World? I, I, I know we took them a long time ago and I said I'm never doing it again because it's not that much fun. The lineups are ridiculous and it turns otherwise wonderful beautiful kids into screaming spoiled brats. <laughs> I said you get there and everybody wants it takes a normal kid and and, and teaches them they get whatever they want. And there's no way to say it. It was a terrible, unpleasant experience. Never doing it again. Uh, Robert, I'm going to ask the question here. Then we're going to get the answer on Rumble. Speaking of Disney, speaking of DeSantis, two-part question. If DeSantis graciously bows out today, tomorrow, next week, endorses Trump, can he salvage the political goodwill that I think he lost? Part two of the question, do you think there's any restrictive covenant in his book deal that would preclude him from ever publicly endorsing Trump in the future? To be answered on Rumble People, which is where we're going right now. We're going to end on YouTube and carry on the party on the free speech platform of Rumble. Ending three, two, one, now. Robert, two-part question. Can he salvage what political goodwill he may have lost? Oh, I mean, he can. Uh, I mean, I think some of it is he's damaged himself, but he could definitely salvage some of it and maybe all of it the, uh, by, by reversing course. The, because I think there's still, I mean, he hasn't exhausted that goodwill that he has. He's just weakened and limited it. 
Um, but he could he could salvage a lot by stepping back uh, in, you know, endorsing Trump, saying that now is not the time we have to rally around Trump to rally around the country and the Constitution, et cetera. Answer questions a lot better than he did with Megyn Kelly's interview. Um, and the uh, uh, so, yeah, he, he could definitely improve his and, and then he he would be a legitimate 2028 prospect. Um, I, I think he's burned bridges so badly that vice presidency's off the off the uh, that was his to have is now off mm-hmm. the table. But the but I think he is his gut and, and then he could return to coming up with creative policies in the state of Florida that garner attention and that become the basis for a twenty twenty eight run. Because the uh there's a lot of issues uh, that he hasn't really fully addressed. Like you even even a Dave Rubin. Uh, when Michael Malice asked him about budgetary policy in Florida, Dave didn't know the answer to that. And in order, and Dave is one of the more informed, uh, enlightened, uh, and good intended uh, DeSantis supporters. DeSantis unfortunately lined up a lot of crooks and grifters and scam artists. They've been ripping him off. I mean, his campaign was just getting uh, losing cash hand over fist. Um, but you know the but there were some good people in that in that mix that he uh, uh, that he hasn't fully taken advantage of as well. The smarter policy, you know, have a, a budgetary policy you can use as a model. He claims he would be able to defang the deep state, deep six, the deep state. Well, do the version of that in the Florida administrative regulatory system, which has its own problems. Uh, prove it there. Uh, you know, he's fired one prosecutor. And, you know, that's good, but it's still only one. So it, are there no other Soros or other pro- problematic prosecutors in the entire state of Florida? Somehow I doubt that. Still issues, heavy issues in the bureaucracy in Florida. I mean, nowhere near as severe as the federal system. But there's, if, he, if he's right, hey, I could purge the deep state. Well, prove it in Florida. Start there. Prove it by at least the bureaucratic administrative state that's too heavy there. And so that would be the, that would be the smart decision. The big question is, does his arrogance exceed his competence? Um, I thought his competence was stronger than it was, and he was never going to run in the first place. He's proven me wrong in that regard. Um, and the Now, my bets to short him have been very, very profitable. Everybody that's at sports picks has made a lot, has cashed in heavy uh, on betting shorting DeSantis and betting Bobby Kennedy, just that combo, as well as betting Trump, betting Biden. The uh, so yeah, uh, he definitely could. Now on the restrictive covenant question, I don't know. That would be an unusual one, but that would be interesting to see. I think increase maybe Trump should call for that release of everybody's book deals. Uh, <laughs> someone should call for that. Congress should investigate Obama's book deal. Uh, should investigate. They should also investigate whether Obama's former chef had a book deal. Uh, the the one that you know drowned. <laughs> oh, in, in, what? in Martha's Vineyard. It, it, so it's, it, it's not inconceivable that it, it, who was it? I mean, who gave him the book deal? I know Murdoch had something to do with it. Is it well uh, uh, with DeSantis? It's a yeah. That's that the I think it's Harper Collins. That's a Murdoch connected. So it's uh, not an enterprise. It, it's, not it's not inconceivable. That there was a quid pro quo, and there were stories uh, out there that it wasn't just a one-time ten million dollar book deal, but it was like a five book deal, ten million a pop. It's, it was a guarantee of of wealth of riches. But Des- Murdoch has already completely turned on DeSantis. So that's another reason for DeSantis to exit. New York Post is running snide pieces against him now. That's Murdoch's going to keep escalating. He wants DeSantis out. He thinks he blew his chance. He thinks he's a drag on contesting Trump. Uh, DeS- you know, that's the problem with getting into bed with people like Rupert Murdoch. You know, the uh, it's kind of like Charlie Sheen's character from Two and a Half Men. You know, it's not- chances are he'll be gone in the morning. No, we might. You froze. I think you froze at the exact punchline, like like Charlie Sheen's character, and then we missed the last part. Oh, in two and a half men, uh, so that you know the uh, he may not be there in the morning. Okay, um, we didn't talk about it last week. People were asking, "What do you make of a of a healthy sports guru, fit individual who knows how to swim, drowning off a paddleboard at it?" Eight feet of water. Not that that really makes a difference because I actually know someone who died in eight feet of water, but they didn't know how to swim. Supposedly it was at three to four feet that day. And, and 
Uh, they will not, or they won't release the details of the police call. There was someone else there with him. I mean, it's not conspiracy theory to say this does not make sense. The person I knew who actually drowned uh, did not know how to swim, was walking in water, and it they stepped into a spot that went over their head. It's, it's terribly tragic. Uh, knowing how to swim, being, uh, uh, what did they say? What's the word when you are a, a, an avid swimmer? Makes no sense, and um, people have questions. Okay, Robert, next on the list. What do we got? We got the uh, drag... Drag, queens, drag queen story time in Montana. So this is the lawsuit that seeks to prohibit or enjoin the application of a law that would require rating and evaluating of books. Like the, 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 accu the accusation. Oh, no, the that's the Texas one. This ah, is crap, the I'm getting mixed up. drag queen bill. Uh, okay, Robert. So we'll get to the Texas book ban, but this is the drag <laughs> get, queen bill. There's there's too many uh, trans drag books law laws going into effect and injunctions to prevent them from taking effect. Uh, tell us what's going on with this one. Yeah, all of these reflect a subspecies of people becoming aware of sort of the, the uh, a cultural effort to co-opt kids, either with books in public libraries, teachers talking to their kids about topics they didn't realize their kids were talking about, all kinds of indoctrination taking place either at their school library, taking place in the school classroom, or taking place in public libraries with these drag queen story times to normalize really abnormal behavior. And so you have men dressed up as women in sexually provocative uh, behavior, uh, reading books to little kids. And there's no question that drag queen story time wasn't really intended to be just fun, joyous. It was intended to normalize what many people consider sexual deviancy. So the legislatures of various state governments and various local governments, as it may be applicable, have tried to pass laws to deal with it on top of trans treatments, which is about minors getting these rad radical uh, treatments to change their gender. So all of these are of a subspecies of an indoctrination effort. I mean, to the degree that in the, you know, the, the uh, cake bakery context, they try to force you to coerce speech of make, you know, bake the cake, uh, celebrating trans or other things. So Montana passed a law, and the issue is, so far, almost every law that's gone to federal court has been struck down, whether it's a trans treatment restriction, whether it's a, uh, a, a book limitation on public libraries, whether it's uh, drag queen story time performances, um, any, any of these subspecies of law, for the most part, federal courts are rushing in to knock them down. Sometimes it's because... Uh, it's a little bit of a power grab by some of the state actors involved. Sometimes it's because the laws are not particularly well defined. They're trying to get at something, but they want to keep it vague enough to get what they want without losing uh, what they want. But in the process are creating laws that could get to things that aren't really the focus of the law and raise constitutional questions. But uh, mostly, if you look at the profile of the courts involved, the courts are simply on a different political viewpoint. They socially and culturally are more sympathetic with the trans community uh, and with the the gender identity movement. Uh, they've re that's been reflected in employment decisions and in other cases. And unless religion is directly implicated, much like the vaccine context, federal judges are on the same side as their professional managerial class brethren. This is what happens when you have a society governed between bureaucracy. Politi polit a professional political class taking over representative government, and then ju uh, judges, you're governed entirely by one small sector of society. You know, about one in 10, one in a maximum one in five, really one in 10, maybe one in eight of all people are what you could call professional managerial class people, people with post-college degrees, uh, people that have credentials and licenses, uh, people that have gone whose main pedigree is their education, not their life experience. People who come from multiple generations, of, often of professional managerial class background, so their bubbles are really small. Uh, people who think, uh, like too many people, it turns out, think uh, Barbie movie mantra of third wave feminism is a good idea uh, or just fine, totally normal. So when these judges get these cases, they don't think, why are we mutilating an eight-year-old's genitals? 
uh, why is a, uh, a, a stripper uh, reading books in the public library to a nine-year-old while the nine-year-old's on their lap? Uh, they sit there and say, oh, that's so normal. Oh, that's so normal. I just saw on my TV show last week. That's who these judges are. Um, and so consequently, that's how they approach these cases. So uh, the, the, the drag queen story time bill, the legislatures are still struggling a bit to get to clear definitions. Now, there are some things the judge actually said he didn't know what being in the presence of an 18 year someone under the age of 18 meant. He said that was vague. How is that vague? Someone under the age of 18, you couldn't have a better definition. So some of his rulings were kind of ludicrous and preposterous, uh, the Montana federal court. But the Montana federal court basically came in, set aside the law, said violates First Amendment rights. Vi it's too vague because everything apparently in this judge's view is vague. There were some provisions of the statute that were vague, and there were some provisions of the statute that reached further than they needed to. Because the people, it's a weird title of a case, the uh, the Imperial Sovereign Court of Montana. So you might think, what in the heck is that? Well, that's, of course, the people who sponsor the Pride Parade in Montana. Anybody who's actually been to a Pride Parade uh, these days understands it's not quite what they thought it was. But r r this is what I don't understand. Like, the judge says that the measure will likely disproportionately harm not only drag performers, but anyone... <laughs> But any person who falls outside traditional gender and identity norms. My, did you notice his we, reference who, who he was really concerned with? The two spirit people. Are you aware the, of who the two spirit people are? Well, in, in life or in, in, in this particular case? Yeah, at, at all. I mean, you guys. Yeah, it's, it's, it natives. it's, it's natives in, in Canada. Well, I, I, I discovered what the 2S was in the 2S LGBTQIA. It's natives who, who two spirit meaning, I guess uh, the spirit is the gender, and they're they've historical, you know, uh, religious and cultural things that have existed. What I, the only thing I don't I just understand it meant here, a pervert who's a Native American. <laughs> Robert, I'm trying to be uh, diplomatic about this. What it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's I mean, it's, you, I mean, what does that tell you about a judge? I'm really concerned about the two spirit people. It, it, what it is history. Spirit? It's history rhyming that they're cloaking their their abject. Um, it's not tyranny in this case. It's just degeneracy under the veil of benevolence. Yeah. But what I don't understand, right. I can understand. They try to legislate a cultural issue and they come in and say, we're not going to have inappropriate books for your specific age category. Okay, they, there are decency laws out there. There are already um, child abuse laws out there. Why enact new legislation that's going to be problematic and clearly politically targeted as opposed to just enforcing already existing laws of decency, um, an adult twerking their ass in front of a kid is indecent and apply the existing laws. Well, because the they're not. Uh, so there's two problems, really. One, it's it's people who are on the who don't have institutional power uh, using their the one means of institutional power they have available to them, which is the democratic process to check all of the institutions trying to force and indoctrinate their kids in a radical ideas of gender and sexuality. So that's why it's been left up to the legislative branches, because the executive branch isn't enforcing it. The judicial branch is not respecting it. So the, the corporations are all bought in. Uh, you know, there's only for every Bud Light that goes, you know, go woke, go broke. There's a Barbie that go woke, go rich. <laughs> so in order to counteract this, uh, you're left as, as an ordinary parent. Uh, with the, your legislator, legislature, that's pretty much it. And so, and, and you, as you note, there's going to be sloppiness uh, with that. The efforts they probably need to come up with a template law that's a little, uh, you know, the that's clear and cleaner uh, that would avoid these judicial traps. Uh, that that get, now, I, I think some of these judges would have found an excuse to shove it down everybody's throat anyway, because they think this is normal. They think this is okay. They think these are backwards, backwoods, incompetent Americans who need to learn what good values are. Take your kid to Barbie six more times so you get the message. These judges believe in this. Even so-called conservative judges generally believe in this. Their only restraint is on religion. Or if you're messing around with a big corporation, then they become very sympathetic. Uh, but otherwise, sadly, they, they don't because it's a, it's a prejudice of the professional class as a class, 
Not everybody has it, but 80% or more have it. It's a virus within that community. And so the uh, that's what I think that the problem. Now, here, the key is obscenity laws don't reach it because obscenity laws require it be patently offensive, require it be uh, sec- you know, prurient, sexually suggestive, and the according to community standards. But the, the key third part is the carve out. And this is why they're they're not including these in the either the book limitations or the or the drag queen story time performances and the rest is because if it has any scientific, artistic, literary, or politically expressive, this is by the way what uh, that nitwit Jew hating Andrew Torba <laughs> at Gab doesn't understand. He's like, I'm a purist on the First Amendment. No, he's not. The because if it has scientific, political. A literary or artistic value, he has to allow the pornography he doesn't allow on his platform because all of that at various levels can fit one of the four. And so that's where they run into trouble. They're trying to reach these issues that don't fit the current constitutional constraint on obscenity. Yeah, okay, now that's... here, um, the there were some laws that were still, some words left vague, more vague than they needed to be. Yeah, they well, they, I'm not gonna, sex, sexually oriented performances, removal or simulated removal of clothing in a sexual manner. And I can, under, first of all, if they're going to, if they're going to ban sexually oriented performances, uh, Nicki Minaj, WAP is going to have to, you know, you can't play that publicly. So they're going to, that, that'll be one argument. Removal I mean, of clothing. Yeah, sorry, go for it. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that, that's where they, they could be a little more clear, be a little more specific. Uh, use the laws on the books governing adult clubs and adult bookstores. Uh, now, in some of these cases, they've done that. And these courts are pretending, the courts are saying, well, though, uh, because they restrict access already uh, based on age to First Amendment protected materials that are uh, uh, prurient materials. They're not, they're not obscene. They're just considered sexually explicit. And because of that, they're allowed to limit minor access to it. Mm-hmm. And so the and you're right, there's child abuse laws in the books that allow a very broad interpretation, I think too broad often interpretation of what that means, because it's shifting power from the parent to the state when you do that. Um, but so I, I think there's aspects of this that need improvement. But what they're really running into is hostility from the judicial branch, because they're on the other side of the culture wars, uh, in my take. Um, and so the judge issued a temporary restraining order and validating the entire law. Now, here's the another problem. Too many of these states in their attorney general's office are usually defending it. Same professional managerial class, same prejudice. In the Arkansas trans case, they managed not to produce hardly any evidence in support of the trans treatment laws. Uh, And and here, and and now this was done on an emergency basis to make sure that the pride fest could go out. And people don't know, like people take their kids to those pride fest and they're shocked at often what they see. They don't understand they're sexually explicit activities that should not be permitted. Uh, and I mean permitted mm-hmm. in the permit sense of the word. The permit should limit that conduct. You know, you want to raise the rainbow flag, have at it. Uh, that doesn't give you a right to be naked. That doesn't give you the right to be sexually explicit uh, in the kind of things you're doing. That doesn't allow you, pride doesn't extend to pedophilia uh, and being a pederast. Uh, which some of these people seem to be confused about. I think in, the plus in, means a lot of things. You know, setting aside the um, constitutional argument of decency, there are, are laws against uh, public nudity, like it or not. And I, when I went to the I went to the Pride um, event in Montreal in 2018, and a lesbian woman that I was friends with at the time uh, said, "You know, uh, M- Montreal's good, but don't take your kids to the one in Toronto. That's a little hardcore." And it's like, first of all, I'm not taking my kids to the one in Montreal anyhow. It was it was pretty innocuous. They've since gotten less innocuous, but e- even the community appreciated it was hardcore. The one in Toronto, where I mean, you there was stuff that kids are not supposed to see. Extraordinary thing to me is if you're in the LBGTQ community and you want to claim you're not obsessed with gender, you're not obsessed with sex, and you're not uh, deviant or perverted in, in, in a way, why do parades and why do events that appear to be, that most people describe as perverted and disgusting, sex-obsessed and gender-driven? They keep proving their critics correct. I mean, if they were, you know, I know plenty of people who are gay who are not out there doing the pride nonsense. Um 
not true for, I mean, as I've pointed out before, the rate of domestic violence in the trans community is off the charts. That's a mental illness. That's what that is 90% of the time. Uh, I know there's some people born with certain conditions, et cetera, but 90% of the time, people that are trans are mentally ill and should be nowhere near teaching kids anything, reading anything to kids. That's that's the reality of it. They don't want to hear that, and they'll go, and they prove they're not nuts by going nuts every time you tell them maybe you're nuts. Yeah, I, 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 Anyone who wants to witness it and judge for yourselves, go look at my live stream of the Ottawa protest uh, education, not indoctrination. And you look at both sides of the protest, protesters and counter protesters. And if you come to the conclusion that both sides are equally rational, logical, and sane in their behavior, we will agree to disagree in our assessment of reality. But yeah. Now, that naturally transitions into Texas's attempt to deal with this in school libraries. Uh, the, the Texas book ban, as it's being called, uh, they filed suit. I don't think a federal court has ruled on it yet. Uh, I think the filed suit in Austin. So if they get the right judge, they'll be ready to roll there too. Um, but I do have more problems with uh, the way they went about enforcing this. Uh, two issues here. One is I agree with the general principle that libraries should be run locally, not by the feds, not by the state. So I'm not in favor of the state getting in the business of controlling local libraries. Uh, you know, the, the, instead, that should be a local legislative issue, county commission, school board, et cetera. And if you lose at that level, you lose at that level. So be it. Um, but what's amazing is this, you know, the, uh, the same people that say bake the cake, you know, because their goal is they don't really care about free speech. They care about indoctrination. And they want to use their First Amendment rights to indoctrinate your kids. In do um, I'll, I'll add to that. Indoctrination and submission. They, it, it's a oh, question yeah. of dominance and submission. And I'll, and I'll read a section of this lawsuit in a second, Robert. Please carry on. Well, Paul Joseph Watson puts it, they'd like your death, but they'll accept your submission. Uh, Michael Malice says the same thing often. Yeah. Um, the, and so uh, that's, there's definitely attributes of that. But here, the way they passed the law, they said anybody who provides books to libraries has to impose a rating and licensing system, and they use the movie system as their guidance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably a little bit of a trickier route to run. Uh, it looks like the old censorship boards that states had between 1920 and 1980, uh, where they were involved in things past just what was going into public libraries or school kid libraries. So I think the goal of removing sexually explicit materials from access to kids is a good goal. I think the method, uh, the devil's in the details, is questionable because it could open it up to not only easy constitutional challenges, but also abuses of state power. But um, it, and you, you have also you have a rating a, requirement. It kind of sounds like coerced speech, so it has that problem too. But but you have a rating system for movies. You have a rating system for music. You have a rating system for video games. Why could you not just as easily have a equally applicable rating system for books. And I think that will be their argument. There will be, the argument is that, that that's uh, all that they are doing is mirroring it. There's just aspects where either definitionally or in criminal enforcement or civil suit provisions, they go beyond what those mm. regulatory systems do. And my understanding on some of these is that those are voluntary rating systems imposed by various Co collections and consortiums of private companies rather than imposed at the state governmental level, though I haven't looked at it in quite some time. Um, but the I, I think what they should avoid is looking like censorship boards. And they shouldn't strip power from either parents or local governments that better belong there than at the state level or federal level. Um, I think that's where they, the problem is real. The solutions still are a little bit hit or miss. Yeah, I mean, I'm reading it. It's, this is the allegations out of the lawsuit. They've defined the book ban as the legislation requires booksellers assess all books previously sold to public schools that remain in active use, rate them as sexually explicit material or sexually relevant if applicable. And they say, you know, they go on to try to define these terms. Yeah, all right. That can be an administrative burden. Was, that's something librarians are already supposed to do. I mean, I, mean I, I would find it easier rather than rating things or the rest. Um, that that no state funded public library 
uh, shall have books uh, uh, accessible to minors that fit certain categories of uh, what is otherwise obscene but might have value, but you're allowed to limit uh, expli- sexually explicit con- First Amendment uh, materials, even if not obscene, uh, from access to minors. I think that would have been a simpler path to pursue and then maybe create private rights of action to sue as the enforcement mechanism that would effectively wake those people up rather than create a new regulatory schema licensing board that inv- invites more state power that's probably always going to get abused down the road for something way past the purpose of this. And who was it? Oh, okay. No, it doesn't matter. I was uh, talking about potential solutions to this problem, but everyone should go watch the Patrick Bet David, um, Anthony Weiner interview. It's Classic. Okay, interesting. So that lawsuit has just been filed. There's been no decision um, or no interim uh, restraining order issued. Uh, we'll see where it goes with that. And now, speaking um, of uh, people that know a lot about obscenity and perverts, <laughs> I was say, speaking uh, of degeneracy, the... Hunter B- Robert. Okay, so here, here's the deal. Devin Archer. Here's the deal. I just sound like Joe Biden for a second. Devin Archer. Uh, I don't know that many people know enough about him. I just you know summarily looked into his history or past was one of um, uh, Hunter Biden's business associates, or at least worked with Burisma as well, was convicted of conspiracy to defraud a Native American tribe in 2018. His sentence was handed down in February 2022, postponed until appeal. He has now, he's a criminal, I guess. He's a criminal because he's been convicted. Maybe he's exonerated and I'll have to refer to him as uh, no longer a criminal. Been convicted for fraud. Has turned whistleblower to... uh, show up before congressional hearings and testify as to the degree to which Joe Biden was well aware of Hunter Biden's business dealings, the corrupt, uh, corrupt is an understatement, uh, family, that everything's been going on. Hunter Biden working for Burisma, uh, Joe Biden well aware of it, apparently maybe the 10% for the big guy, all of this. Come, he's scheduled to testify today. I haven't been caught up on his testimony. Gets a letter from the Department of Justice calling for him to show up for prison. I mean, you're going to have to explain this because I don't know. I I understood that his sentence was suspended pending appeal or so I thought. I don't know what violation he is alleged to have committed that would now see the Department of Justice say, go straight to jail, forget the suspension pending appeal. Who is Devin Archer above and beyond my superficial understanding? And what is the argument to all of a sudden say, show up to jail, although their counter argument to this is we weren't trying to prevent him from testifying because we told him to show up for jail uh, after he would have testified. So it's all clean and kosher. There's no witness intimidation here. Bullshit, unless I've misunderstood something. But who's Devin Archer? And what would be the basis to make him go to jail now if he has not had his sentence suspended pending appeal? So, uh, you know, the Hunter Biden was always uh, Joe Biden's bag man. And it was this idea that uh, Hunter was doing all this out on his own, on his own accord to feed his own habits uh, that his poor father was kind of saddled with is utterly ludicrous. Uh, That this was being done at the instruction uh, at the behest and behalf of Joe Biden. So that's the first thing that people should understand. This is not a family member trying to cash in on political cachet. This is a kid effectively being ordered, coerced, and forced by his father to be his personal bag man uh, for various forms of bribes and favors while he was senator and vice president. And uh, during that time period, they put together a, this is the Biden style, you put together an old school political machine of friends and allies and and included, I believe, the son of uh, a relative of Senator Kerry. Uh, who was then Secretary of State Kerry for a period of time under the Obama administration, like John Kerry needed the money. I mean, or the kid needed the money. But these are people that are just addicted to more cash, part of a degeneracy of Washington, D.C., writ large, a declining empire, uh, you know, parasitically surviving off the peasantry by selling them out to foreign interest. And that's what Hunter did. And so the Devin Archer was a partner in that. And along with others. And so they were scamming people all the time. Now, sometimes the scams were so bad, they didn't deliver on the bribes. They took the bribe and didn't deliver the quo that came with the quid. Uh, Whether that happened in certain Chinese cases, happened in certain Native American tribe interests. 
Uh, and this is the lobbying game writ large. Pretty much every lobbyist in Washington, D.C. you could send to prison. Because in my experience with them, I've never trusted a word they say. You, they always use, you know, gobbledygook and, and, mo, and you know, but they have secret mojo connections. And in and, and, and my world, criminal tax representation, that gets exposed. So when somebody says, oh, I got the connections and I can work it out and it's going to be a sweetheart, blah, blah, blah. And that never happens. And it does never happen. Then that tells people that these lobbyists are full of it. But in the world of legislation, in the world of executive enforcement, it's always hard to know what's really happening behind the scenes. They use that lack of transparency to just rob people blind. So that's the accusation in part against Devin Archer uh, was that as part of this sort of ongoing lobbying operation, he scammed some Native American tribes. Archer clearly believed that his connections to Hunt, to Joe Biden would protect him politically. And when he ended up indicted and ended up convicted, and then the Second Circuit Court of Appeals uh, didn't reverse and affirm the conviction, as when he's like, screw this, I'm starting to talk to Congress because I, I got a lot of records. And since you boys won't step in to save me, uh, I'm going to throw you boys under the bus. So uh, what happened is on the Saturday before, now this was misreported by some people in the press because of the confusion that can happen around the federal criminal process. Uh, once the a mandate had issued from the Second Circuit after they had affirmed his conviction, that opened that he was likely granted bail pending appeal. The There's an argument for revocation of his bail pending appeal and that he now be issued a date to self-surrender to prison. Why? What would be the argument oh, so, for revocation of appeal? So typically what happens is you could get detained pending trial if you're not given bail. Mm -hmm. Once convicted, there's a bias in favor of detention. So you have to make an argument for it to stay on bail pending sentencing. Then usually what happens at your sentencing is they give you 30 days to quote unquote self-surrender. So they to wherever the U.S. Marshals, the U.S. Marshals will notify you, but it's the Bureau of Prisons that picks the prison for you to self-surrender to. So a self-surrender date basically just tells the Marshals to tell the Bureau of Prisons, tell us where this guy's going so we can notify him. So if he doesn't show up on the date in question, we can go tell the judge and arrest him and take him there. Um. The, I've had a few ex-clients, you know, skip out on self-surrender date. Uh, and so the U.S. Marshals helped, uh, you know, give them a ride there. The reason why you want to do a self-surrender date is if you get stuck inside, you get what they call the bus ride, the special bus ride. They do this all the time, the feds, to harass people. It's quasi-torture. It's just what, not what, legally recognized. What is the special bus ride? So what happens is they stick you on a bus to go to your facility. But that bus, one, is extremely uncomfortable. You're in handcuffs and cuffs on your feet. And the bus tends to go everywhere. And it's, it's like picking up George, picking up Joe. It's like the Uber share ride from hell. And you're <laughs> stuck on that thing often for days and days and days. Uh, so you can imagine it. Dry they actually use this in a famous case from a, a case out west that people may remember, a quasi-cult case. Um or, you know, some people would say that, uh, to, to get a guy to confess. He just couldn't handle the bus ride. So, I mean, that's how egregious it is. So you always want the self-surrender. You don't want to be stuck in the federal detention with the hardcore criminals. You don't want to be stuck on that bus ride. You want to, to be able to voluntarily just show up at the facility uh, so you don't have to deal with any of that. Um, so the self So that part of the process, saying, hey, judge, by the way, the appeal's been reversed. We think... Uh, there should be a, a surrender date set. That's not that unusual. What's unusual is when they did it. Mm -hmm. Now, it got interpreted as they're trying to arrest him before he shows up in Congress. That wasn't what it was. They, they That wouldn't legally happen. Uh, all, all that is is, hey, judge, we think a self-surrender date should be set because he lost a Second Circuit appeal. Technically, what they're really asking for is a no that his bail – pending appeal is now exhausted because his appeal is exhausted. Now his appeal to the U S Supreme court is not exhausted. So that's where their argument was. We're going up to the U S Supreme court. So we think bail pending appeals should stay. 
uh, for the U.S. Supreme Court to resolve it. This is why the issue wouldn't happen. Nothing was going to happen fast because the, the district court was going to have to assess all this. So then the question becomes, because they couldn't actually arrest him, couldn't actually force him into custody right away, why send that letter on a Saturday? Well, so that now that was my first question. The letter was drafted and sent on a Saturday, not received and reported for whatever the reason on a Saturday. No, not to be uh, glib, what kind of state worker is working on a Saturday in the absence of an emergency? A a and I guess that the one that's worried about what Devin Archer is going to say to the Congress. <laughs> so the uh, oh. uh, uh, no quack because remember he was supposed to testify last week, so it's clear that the feds have been trying to put pressure on him not to testify. And he, and if his lawyer was smart, his lawyer might have been trying to negotiate. His lawyer might have been saying, "Hey, why don't we look at this, or why don't we reconsider this?" And uh, you know, you know, and then, and then maybe you know he has no motivation to to step forward, uh, or he decides to you know just not do it or not participate. Because um, he he technically, even though he's been convicted, would still have Fifth Amendment rights. So the uh, uh, and clearly they did they weren't getting what they wanted, but it, it was punishment. There was no, there's no doubt about it. it. They sent the letter in to say, this is a reminder how we can punish you if you do things we don't like. We can accelerate your self-surrender date. We can, uh, and who knows what happens with which prison you may get assigned. Who knows if maybe an arrest warrant isn't issued for you at some point instead of a self-surrender date. I mean, it's meant to, wet, the last power they have, they used to try to threaten them. Now they got called on it. So later the same day, they sent a letter to the judge saying, we don't want to interfere with his appearance before Congress. We would never want to do that. A load so of it, was, it was obvious to everyone what they were trying to do. Okay. Uh, working on a Saturday in the absence of an emergency, but there is an emergency, his testimony today, which I, mean, I haven't no gotten. emergency in sending that letter. I mean, that's just normally the mandate comes back. The district court sets a date. There's no, what's the rush? There's usually no rush. Uh, for that. that, that, that I've never seen that done ever. You know, the uh, so it it was purely punitive as a reminder to Devin Archer before he testified. The federal government still has a few quills left in the that they can use. Now, Robert, before we get into the plea deal that is, uh, that seems to be on permanent hold right now, unless something happened today, let me uh, address or at least read the 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 rumble rants that I haven't read yet. Very quick. Reloading conception between mid September for birth July 1st and mid November for birth July 31st. All right, we got Marty Smith fan. Did I read this? I was conce I was conceived 2798 and born 117. Oh, that that's pretty much that's pretty much no, that's normal. Uh, hi, Viva, and thanks. I got this already. I did not know what a twit Neil was. Oh, that's Neil deGrasse Tyson, not Neil Farage. We're gonna get to that later. Crazy Guru Disney has been abusive in all. In all sense of the word, for a long time, I, I had no idea how deep that rabbit hole went when I went down it. Uh, Jennifer says, the Santimonious is done. MAGA will never, ever trust him again. And the Republican Party is the, MAGA, is the MAGA party and doesn't exist without MAGA. Ronnie blew it and will never get the approvals again. He's dropping to third now. Crazy Guru 1, coercion of anything negative around our children is pure evil. God's children are not for sale. Finboy Slick, someone under the age of 18 is vague. What if they identify as 18? J jokes, but not jokes. That's going to be that's going to be the next uh, level of, you know, legalizing that which is illegal. Vivek made his fortune selling hedge funds, the sleaziest part of the stock market. Think about that. Never mind being part of the pharma industry. Why so much trust for him? That's from my Mr. Tux, Crazy Guru One. You and Barnes have put me on American time because <laughs> I think I think Crazy Guru is in the UK. Okay, good. Thank you for all those crumble rants, Robert. The plea deal. Th th there's no news above and beyond the plea deal uh, imploding, exploding, evaporating. They, they didn't. They didn't finalize a plea deal today. Not that I know of. No. The. Okay, I good. mean, really, the, the deal with. I mean, it was the big story of the week, uh, and I was surprised that people did not fully absorb. Well, I, I think our board knew it, but like people were actually surprised in the media, in some of the legal media, because they hadn't been watching the Sunday show, probably. Uh, mm -hmm. They had been derelict in their duties. Uh, actually believed that this was not a quid pro quo to uh, be an immunity deal. And that's why he said from the very beginning. He said, this is just like the Hillary deal. This isn't about the tax charges. This isn't about the gun charges. This isn't about the drug charges. This is all about giving him immunity 
on the money laundering and the bribery and the foreign age, illegal lobbying charges so that he cannot be a witness against his uh, mm-hmm. dad, President Joe Biden. That's what this is about. And the taxes just the charges are, are a fig leaf for that. And people were actually shocked. They're like, oh, my goodness, there was this other deal there. It's like, yeah, of course there was. Now, what was what I was always curious about was I wanted to see what the deal was because it's all about the language. In other words, how broad is it explicitly in the paragraph, the immunity given? Number one, and that means not only the immunity in terms of sub- subject matter, but also immunity in terms of which office. So to give people an idea, one, immunity given as part of a plea deal is pretty rare. So that it's not commonly done at all. Number two, when it's done in the federal system, it's only done by the local United States attorney's office. It does not extend to any other U.S. attorney's office. Here it was obvious that other U.S. attorney's offices would have jurisdiction. So I was curious whether they did the, the thing that's almost unheard of, which say this plea, this non-prosecution agreement applies to the entire federal government, no matter where located. And, the, uh, and so those are the two big questions that I had. Uh, and then the third was, where did they place it? Uh, now, here's where they were really creative. Uh, so the so the first part is the plea deal, the way they did the facts was by by indirect inference and by incorporation, which was really smart. As, 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 as grifters, I keep telling people, as criminals go, Joe Biden's not a complete idiot. He's a complete idiot about everything else in life. But when it comes to stealing and thieving at your local level, your gangs in New York level, He's actually halfway decent. He's a decent, he's an old school local Tammany Hall political boss who is, but he's one of the worst versions of that. Cause you had some good, you know, versions of that, that were protective of their community, really tried to leverage their power to look after the less fortunate, uh, et cetera. And then you had the worst version of that. That was, you know, using it to sexually harass and assault people and get away with their own crimes and pocketing money. Right. So like any system, you can have some good and bad versions of it. Biden is the bad version of it. Um, but what they did is, well, first they put the agreement itself, the pro- non not in the plea deal. They put it in the diversion deal, which is the funniest thing. As they said, they don't know of that ever happening in the history of Amer- America. You're putting a non-prosecution immunity agreement in a diversion deal. Uh, hold on, hold on a second. I- you, you, uh, you cut out again there. They put the non-prosecution in the diversion deal, not in the say say what you just said again. Sure, sure. So they uh, normally you would put a non prosecution agreement in the plea deal. Normally, it would only apply to the local U.S. Attorney's Office, and normally they would specify which crimes you, you would not be prosecuted for. Uh, <coughs> but that often that's where the real trick is. Sometimes the language is these specific statutes. Sometimes the language is longer and details exactly what's not being prosecuted for. Other times it will just say you won't be prosecuted for information possessed currently by the local U.S. attorney's office concerning you. Um, And I was so that's where I was curious what language they used. Uh, Then they put it in the plea agreement itself. The plea agreement is usually often published and becomes a matter of public record. Instead, they took the plea, the immunity agreement and only didn't even reference it in the plea deal. Instead, only referenced it in the diversion deal. And the diversion deal doesn't require federal judicial approval. Only the plea deal does. The diversion deal, you don't have to publish. But the concern for a federal judge is if the reason you're entering a plea is something outside of that plea deal, That creates big problems for the court, and they want that to be part of the public record. So by trying to sneak it into the diversion deal and keep it hidden from the world, what they were doing, they triggered the court's concern that that would create that this would create a bad record Uh, because he could uh, Biden could later go forward and say uh, critical information was omitted from the plea hearing. It wasn't an adequately done plea hearing. I want to set it aside, et cetera. Um, so that's what triggered this judge, a patent judge appointed by Trump or a patent legal background, not patent judge. If I stop, if I can stop you there, would this have happened if it had been, 
I can't think of a name offhand, but um, who was the one in, um, oh, geez, in Michael Flynn's case? Would this have happened if it were an Obama-appointed judge? Would anyone have looked into it with this, with this, I don't say degree of scrutiny, with this degree of judicial uh, insight? So it's I think because she's a patent judge, she has no experience in the in, in the government work. Uh, and, and those judges as a whole tend to have two characteristics. One, they don't defer to the government automatically. They don't have an ex, they don't have a history of doing so. They don't they're not bound by it. They're willing to be que- question the, the, uh, the government challenge and contest the government. They don't always go your way, but they, they are, will be more independent of thought than your average federal judge. Also, if you're in patent law, chances are you're very smart. Uh, So you've got someone that is usually high IQ. The second thing is they tend to just follow the laws written. And so consequently, you get judges that are much more law-oriented judges uh, than you get typically that are more politically-oriented judges. Now, even a judge, though, that had been well-versed in this probably would have been concerned uh, if the – but here's the key. This judge requested the diversion agreement. A if a judge had not requested the diversion agreement, this they would have, have gone right. Through. Mm-hmm. Right, correct. Um, it would have created this future amazing. risk uh, that that in terms of the how the plea the plea hearing would not have been constitutionally adequate because key aspects of consideration would have been never discussed, um, and, and that would have been a problem. Uh, but it, only a problem if Hunter Biden made it one. Uh, and here's where some people are missing some things. Even if the plea deal is never enforced by the judge, that doesn't necessarily matter. The government has already signed a contract with Hunter Biden. They've already given him immunity. They can't take that back. So that's where people, in other words, Hunter might get denied the benefit of mis- of no time. Uh, but what can't happen is for the government to come in and say, we're not giving you any immunity anymore. And now we're going to prosecute you for a bunch of stuff. That that's what, that's what really can't happen. And so Hunter's lawyers, once they got that in writing, they got it in writing. So it's like when a defendant signs a plea deal, he can back out of it, but there's a whole bunch of consequences that flow from it for breach for the government. They can't breach of any agreement is a uh, requires dismissal of any indictment. And here, what they did in the diversionary agreement, it's contract like anything else, as the judge pointed out. They is Here's how they did the immunity. They did, I was curious how they were going to hide this. And the way they hid it, uh, they didn't say what I thought they would, which is any information within the possession and custody of the local U.S. attorney's office is we will not prosecute on. Instead, they said the entire United States because they wanted to make sure uh, nobody could come after him uh, and use him then as a weapon against his father. And the and again, his dealings were connected to deep state operations, to other Democratic families, including the Kerry family. So I guarantee you somewhere along the way, you're going to have Clinton connections. So Hunter implicates the entire corrupt deep state Democratic machine, not just his father, Joe Biden. His probably his only mistake and Papa Joe's only mistake was he didn't use the Bill Clinton method. And the Bill Clinton method, as he bragged about to his security guards in Arkansas, is reported in Roger Morris's book, Something Partners, is it Partners in Something uh, book, late 90s, really good book. Roger Morris comes from the left, by the way. He said, look, uh, he goes, these boys can, he goes, they're never going to do anything with me. He goes, everything that they can try to get me on implicates them too. And Bill Clinton would then he'd laugh, ha, ha, ha. So, uh, you know, just research Mina, Arkansas. Why did Ken Starr end up only talking about Monica Lewinsky instead of all the extensive corruption in Arkansas? Because all of that Arkansas corruption implicated the CIA, implicated key people in the Pentagon, and implicated a certain family named the Bush family. And that's why the honest, ethical Ken Starr, conservatives used to tell me he wanted to be, you know, should be on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, it's like, well, why didn't he do any of the, uh, that? Why, why did he drop the Vince Foster inquiry and clear Vince Foster instead? Why was that? Uh, might be some reasons for that. But you can get more of that at the hush hushes on the Clinton death curse at vivaporneslaw.locals.com, which we might have to extend to the Obama death curse if it keeps rolling <laughs> out. The, uh, 
uh, you know the you know that had Haitian connections, so it all goes back to Africa maybe uh, with some some voodoo. But the uh, so the, that's why they can't. But they could never touch Clinton. But Hunter didn't, and Joe never operated that way. They didn't operate on bipartisan corruption. It was it was old school political machine style. Oh, it who? was. I'm going to empower. It's the reason Obama picked him. Obama didn't pick Biden because he had appealed to blue collar middle America. He picked Biden because Biden was a connection to the old school. Demo- he picked Hillary as Secretary of State because she was the new wave of Democratic political corruption, and Joe Biden because he was the connection to old school Democratic political corruption. And thus, he had both of his bases covered while he took out his adversaries in Chicago using weaponized lawfare, including Jesse Jackson III and the governor within months of him getting into office. Both of his old local uh, potential adversaries out of power. Uh, You know, that's what all this was about. And again, if a chef gets a little unwieldy, take him for a little swim in the three-foot pool. Um, So the net effect of all of this in aggregate is the immunity deal is probably still locked in. So the uh, he still has the benefit of that. The only thing is that uh, uh, he what the court tried, brilliant actions by the court. I'm not sure how much he stumbled into this just by trying to follow the law and apply it to the facts and how much of it was sophisticated. Because what she did in the court hearing was first out the scope of this immunity deal. Second, and on the backstory for this, the people that don't know, A lot of this came to her attention because the Hunter Biden's lawyers pretended to be from the Republican National Committee, apparently, or not, I mean, the Republican Committee in Congress that had sent an amicus brief to the court saying they had issues with the plea deal. And apparently the clerk of the court had taken that down because she thought a lawyer from the committee had called her and told her it was a mistake to have it published. And it turned out it was Hunter Biden's own lawyers uh, who were doing it. So I, that triggered the judge's suspicion even more. The judge uh, uses the hearing to say, what is this agreement over here? Number one. And number two, what exactly does it mean? Uh, because what they did with the immunity is they said, nobody in the United States will prosecute you, Hunter, for anything that's in these attachments. And so you had two different attachments, factual affidavit, factual attachments. I have never seen attachments this long in my life. And and I've been doing criminal tax cases for the better part of a quarter century. You know, you don't see pages and pages of a bunch of ancillary information. You know, it's, it's very limited typically. Sometimes it's not even, there is no attachment even. So, but here you know why all of the detail is here. It's so that they can make sure that as lawyers can tell anybody, you can't prosecute me for that because that fact is connected to this fact over here. So that's why it has all the bribery, all the money laundering, all the drug dealing, all the all the whoring, all the different crimes he's committing under federal law. It just litters it with the with detail. <laughs> Chinese government, Ukrainian government, Romanian government. All of that is filled in there so they can never prosecute him on anything that could be factually related or sourced to anything in there. It's even broader than is a uh, I've never seen it, an agreement effectively this broad outside of a complete fruits and use. I mean, there's what's called fruits and use immunity. We won't use anything against you beyond pure what's called transactional immunity for this transaction. We give you complete immunity. I've only seen a few in my li- lifetime, complete immunity. It says no matter, that you, almost a pardon, that says you cannot be prosecuted for anything you've ever done up until this date mm-hmm. under federal law. That's well portrayed in the TV show The Shield, uh, by the way. <coughs> so that's the scope of it. And the judge outed it all. The judge said, well, before we agree to this plea deal, can you guys tell me what this means? Of course, the government didn't want to admit it. Uh, and she's like, first of all, have you ever done this in a diversion agreement? Nope. Have you ever heard of the government doing it in a diversion agreement? Nope. Have you ever heard of the diversion agreement under these circumstances for this charge? Nope. Have you ever heard of a of an agreement that's not related to the actual charges? <laughs> There's all your immunity is for things you're not even prosecuting them on. Nope. Never heard of that either. Uh, the, is there even an open investigation? Oh, yeah. There's an investigation. All of his other crimes. Uh, that now he'll be, and she's like, but now he's going to be given immunity for all of this, right? 
Um, and and the government doesn't want that on the public record. So like, no, no, he could still be prosecuted for that. And of course, Biden's lawyers need the record to be on their mm -hmm. side. They're like, uh, uh, if that isn't part of the deal, there is no deal. And so the judge is like, you guys figure out whether there's a deal or not, what the meeting of the minds actually is, well, how broad this really is, um, and and whether I even have constitutional authority to sign off on all of this uh, and come back to me. Uh, for now, Hunter will just plead not guilty. The two misdemeanor informations will be filed. I'll put him on his conditions of release. Poor Hunter can't use any drugs, can't go whoring for a little while. Uh, let's see how well he keeps up that that promise. I mean, he was just at the White House having nose candy. Imagine if that party with the nose candy would have happened while he was on conditions of release. That would have created a whole new level of scandal. Um, well, no, they, Robert, because they, they they never found the person who was responsible for the cocaine. It's, uh, it's, it's a true. mystery. They had no idea who did it. No wrapped idea. in it in it. Okay, that's that's um, that's amazing. But are you suggesting that he might still benefit from the immunity even if the plea deal follows through? Falls through. Oh yes, that's where like right now she put him in a trap. That if I was Hunter's lawyers, I would not limit that immunity agreement. I would not limit the language of that immunity agreement. What she's the judge has effectively done is that Hunter's lawyers are now encouraged to publicly agree that the immunity agreement is much smaller than it actually is in order to get the judge to go along with a probationary sentence. And so they have a choice, either go along with the probationary sentence and now open the door for, for prosecutions that we thought we had foreclosed. Because the problem they would have is, let's say that immunity agreement, it's supposed to be interpreted in favor of the defendant right now can be interpreted uh, to totally block anything meaningfully of prosecution. If they go in and say, no, it doesn't block a FARA prosecution. It doesn't block a money laundering prosecution. It doesn't block uh, in, in, in a, a bribery prosecution. Uh, then all of a sudden they've reopened the door. and they, But they would do so only because they want the judge to say yes to probation on misdemeanor charges. They don't want him to do any time at all. Uh, the, the, but the problem, but what they could do is they say, no, I, we already have this immunity agreement and we're sticking with that immunity agreement. And we're not saying it's any limited at all. We don't care if the government wants to pretend it is. We have our interpretation, our understanding. It's right there in plain language. We believe it applies across the board. And what the judges have forced Hunter Biden to do lawyers to do is to either sacrifice the benefits of the immunity deal in order to get the plea deal. The, the the no time or keep the benefits of the immunity deal and gamble on what happens on the sentencing side or even go to trial on the two misdemeanors. He would lose the two. He would lose a trial. He's got no defenses. Um, and some of that information, the plea deal can be used against him. That's the other structure of a plea deal uh, that he, if you breach it as a defendant, on many cases, that information can be used against you. Not in all cases, but many instances. So uh, and the worst sentence would be two years, you know, so it'd be, a, but maybe they think he can't even do that. That's the question. Can can he do in two years effectively, uh, like in Snipes' case? You know, that's often a year because you get out, you know, you get good time, 15% off, then on top of that. And now these days they even have more good time benefits, uh, maybe up to 25%, 30%. Second, you get uh, uh, you get a halfway house usually for the last six months. Not It's like going to rehab, really. Uh, it's not as nice as some rehabs, not definitely not as nice as probably Hunter's rehabs. But, it, it, you know, if I were in Hunter's position, I would want the benefit of that deal rather than uh, the immunity deal, rather than the benefit of the plea deal. But, you know, they may capitulate uh, to cover for Joe, which will put more pressure on Joe to pardon his son, ultimately. If anybody saw me looking down, the dog took a dump and my wife... <laughs> <laughs> My wife just came in and pulled out the bed. I don't know. I think she's cleaning it. I was going to do it while we were live, but that might have been TMI, which I've already given. Okay, fascinating and interesting. So the plea deal looks like it's it's off the table now, but the immunity you think is still there, which... Oh, which he, he has, there's no question he has the immunity deal, and he can have for, the... But, but what the, for what? What does he have? The, for everything? Oh, he has immunity for everything, really. Immunity for everything. Right. What it is is she's trying to trap him the judges, maybe not deliberately, into giving up some of the benefits of the immunity deal he currently has. 
So the immunity deal is there and it doesn't depend on the plea deal. So Mm -hmm. what the judge is saying is if you want the plea deal, then you and the government have to agree on the scope of the immunity deal. And the government wants that to be a limited interpretation to cover for CYA for political reasons. Because these are two very political prosecutors who, by the way, love to throw the mat, you know, send people to the max for much lesser things all the time, which mm-hmm. tells you how political this entire case is. It's it violated Justice Department policy for them to do this deal. It violated tax division policy for them to do this deal, violated local U.S. attorney policy for them to do this deal. Uh, it violated the customs and protocols of the office that they do this deal. It violated their own personal customs and protocols to do this deal, which tells you it's a deal done at the top, by the top, for the top. Uh, and, you know, this is the Biden family corruption tree, which implicates the deep state and the Democratic Party writ large. Uh, because, again, Hunter's in Ukraine. Hunter was connected to the biolab operations in Ukraine. Now, that was smart by Joe. Joe probably just saw it as a short-term cash pocket opportunity. But by doing so, he embedded Biden corruption in big pharma corruption. He embedded Biden corruption in Defense Department corruption. He embedded Biden corruption in the CIA corruption, State Department corruption. And that's what. And so right now, Hunter Biden has complete immunity from pretty much everything. He can only uh, be suck, you know, suckered into giving that up if... Uh, he uh, wants the benefits of the plea deal if the government's not willing to go on the record admitting it's as broad as it is. Okay. That's the that's what the plea hearing was really all about. In wicked, wicked corruption. Period. Now, anybody can can anybody get impeached over this? Uh, does Merrick Garland have? Oh, to me, yes, absolutely. Off? I mean, that this deal was even done. Lisa Monaco, I had to have signed off. Merrick Garland had to have signed off. In all likelihood. The tax division head had to sign off. So every single person that signed off on this should be subject to impeachment hearings because it's clear political weaponization of their offices for special preferential favored treatment to cover up the corruption of the existing president. And I think Biden can be impeached by it for his own complicity in it. In other words, he would be impeached not for the original crime that took place prior to him being president. I don't think that's an impeachable act. I think what uh, necessarily... Uh, I go back and forth on that. Um, But at a minimum, because I think if impeachment is the exclusive remedy once you become president, then arguably it's always the exclusive remedy, even if you if you only find evidence of the crime after the person has become president. So that would be a theory by which you could impeach and remove for a pre-presidential crime, even though I generally prefer impeachment to be limited to those. And I think there's constitutional argument for it to be limited to crimes committed while president. But here the crime would be corruption, would be obstruction of justice, would be effectively buying off witnesses through his control of the Justice Department. So it would fit the classic combination, a serious fel- felonious crime, number one, that happened while he was president. Number two, that used the power of the presidency uniquely to do that crime. And that three, cannot be cured by an election. And so I think they're just the Hunter Biden case is an example of corruption. And if they're smart like Trump is, what the Republican Party has shown no capacity of yet, they would do what Trump is doing, which is what Trump is doing is linking the two to the Ukrainian war. He goes, Americans' lives are at risk, and we're at risk of World War III because a foreign government lined the pockets of our existing president. That's where the real impeachment power and potency is. Of course, that would mean exposing the Pentagon, the CIA, the State Department, the deep state, the military industrial complex. And Kevin McCarthy doesn't have any cojones when it comes to that. So I don't think they'll ever do it. But somebody in, you know, Thomas Massey, Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene, somebody should start pursuing that angle, Uh, even if it doesn't reach the full house, force the full house at least to vote on it, Uh, do some investigation into it. Uh, but I believe Merrick Garland, Lisa Monaco, uh, uh, and President Biden can all be impeached just based on the corruption involved in the Hunter Biden deal. Okay. Well, and that's now, a, speaking of a, Biden it's a, corruption, it's a good the segue. Last time, you know, the, 
the last time true uh, independent uh, pre- candidate for the Democratic Party for the presidency uh, ran for the president uh, was Robert Francis Kennedy in 1968, and the uh, who tried to out a wide range of corruption, including future deep state corruption once he became president in the assassination of his brother, President John Kennedy. Uh, was himself assassinated uh, in L.A. Uh, in Octo- in in the summer of 1968, and because of it, they passed uh, several laws. One was a gun control law, but the other thing they passed was the Secret Service provisions would always be pre- uh, available to any substantial candidate for the presidency. So Robert Francis Kennedy Jr., who has already experienced a wide range of death threats since he's announced his candidacy has been waiting almost three months for that approval uh, in the most detailed Secret Service request ever made that I'm aware of, and the Biden administration this week denied it. Uh, I talked about it on Tim Tim Pool. Mark Robert last night clarified some of the details where I said the individual who, the security who is alleged to have potentially shot RFK point blank was not Secret Service, but was the hotel security, but not RFK's own security. The, nope. the obvious joke, and I say joke in, in quotes, but the, 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 the nastiness of this entire story, people are saying, well, RFK Jr. probably doesn't want Secret Service protection in the first place. My angle on all of this is oh, no, for the no, party. RFK Jr. does. He specifically requested it. He absolutely well, the, wants Secret Service protection. The, the he question would be filled like, out a long, detailed application to get it. I meant more along the lines of uh, he might not, I, whether or not it was a, a, a point to be proven, he might not trust Secret Service protection insofar right. as the deep state is alleged it, to have been. It would probably complement and supplement his existing protect security protocol. He, he has security all the time anyway. And, and my my reflex on this is that for the party that screams dog whistles at every corner of the street, for them to come out and say, publicly announce, we're denying RFK Jr. Secret Service protection, some could say that is done specifically to advise the general public. Check out this guy; he doesn't have our, he doesn't have Secret Service protection. The, the argument, as far as I understand, we're not 120 days out from an election yet. Therefore, we've exercised our discretion not to offer it. Does it make sense, Robert, or is this actually as lethal and and overt of a dog whistle as I think it is? Oh, it, it, it's it's clear what it is. It, there's no good grounds to deny it. I mean, Hunter Biden showed up at a a convicted felon who's been elected to nothing uh, showed up with a six Escalade or, you know, six SUV, uh, uh, you know, trip to the, to the courthouse. I've never seen that before, by the way. I mean, and, and that was meant to send a signal, right? It, it's in Delaware, Delaware federal court. It's to remind all the U S marshals it's to remind the judges to remind the court clerks who this is. And they just didn't expect to run into a judge that just applied the law in its face. It was just like, hold on a second. Let's make sure this is on the up and up. I don't want to be uh, snookered into something that isn't what it's supposed to be. Uh, because the ju- if that's your patent lawyer types. They tend to be unintimidated in ways that almost every other federal judge would be cowering underneath their desk uh, for. Uh, but it's astounding that on the same day, they give extensive uh, secret, again, Who's ever tried to hurt Joe Biden ever in his entire political career? And you have Robert Kennedy Jr., the son of a man assassinated for running for president against an existing incumbent, uh, the the nephew of a of the last president to be assassinated, uh, that has experienced extensive death threats since his campaign, and he's not given it while Hunter Biden is? That comparison is the most embarrassing comparison for the Biden administration. Some people are going to argue Hunter Biden is the son of the president and therefore gets it automatically. RFK Jr. just an aspiring presidential candidate. Yeah, they they changed that law, though, so that it, the Secret Service is supposed to be available for any time you get to a serious level if you request it. Right. That's it. And, okay. and that sometimes been as low as like two percent. But he, you know, he's been consistently 15 to 20 percent in the polls. So for him not to have it, I mean, for example, if there was an open election, if all parties could vote, he would win the Democratic nomination right? because he has so much support amongst independents and Republicans. So, uh, you know, to deny it to him really is is just it's it tells you who Joe Biden is. Joe Biden, think of a street level criminal, not he's not a mastermind. He's not going to show up as, uh, you know, as Lex Luthor anymore, anywhere. But he's he's as he's your local thug, 
your local and he's good at being your local thug. And this is a local thug move. Um to and especially yeah. to do it on the same day that his son arrives to federal court where he should be being being sent to prison and instead given immunity. It, it's meant to send a message. I mean that that's why he did it. Uh he did it to send a message to the whole world. Remember, he likes to brag about this. He'll randomly say, you don't mess with the Bidens. I mean, he's proud of being a thug. That's what people don't fully appreciate about him because they see the dementia side and the idiot side and they ignore the street thug side. Uh, just like with Obama, they looked at the erudite side or the international side and they forgot he learned his politics in Chicago. He may have got his ideology in Hawaii and Indonesia, uh, he may have got his connections at Colombian three-letter agencies, uh, like the ones his dad dad was recruited uh, by, but he learned his politics in Chicago. And you should watch Kelsey Grammer's The Boss if you want to understand Chicago. Uh, but that's why people couldn't understand Obama in many respects. Definitely not as to whistleblowers and a bunch of other activity. I was like, if you knew who he was, that's exactly what who he is. Understand this about Joe Biden. We have a street-level thug as president of the United States. All right. On that note, Robert, do we move? We have a we have a, a few quick subjects, but then we've got the good Facebook one. Yeah, we, we have a great. Uh, well, the we'll probably wrap up with the Iran one, and then cover briefly the amnesty, UFO, Newberg, the banking, and Facebook over on locals. Okay. But this Iran one is fascinating. The Iran one is not the Mexican one. The guy who was denied uh, restraint. What's the what's oh, the Iran? That one we can cover quickly. I mean, basically, the guy sells religious keychains around Mexico City. The cartel came to him and said, you got a nice little business there. We're going to use your business to run drugs. And he said, no, no, I just I sell keychains. I'm really good at selling mm -hmm. keychains. I'm just a hustler. Just let me sell my keychains. We're little religious keychains around the, the heart of Mexico City where the, the great cathedral is. And so they came back and helped motivate him, uh, beat the crap out of him, et cetera. So it's like, if you want to stay alive and not get the crap kicked out of you, you can still do your little keychain. And they did this, by the way, kind of Joe Biden style, in the presence of Mexican police officers who just watched as this little vendor, little religious vendor, got the crap kicked out of him. So it's he goes back, he decides to deal, to let him use his operation to deal drugs, feels guilty about it. And he's like, I'm out of here. I'm just going to move to somewhere else outside the city and try to find another place, which obviously is not going to work as well as downtown where the cathedral is, but they track him there. And they're like, no, 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 no buddy, you got a good business. Uh, you're going to keep doing this. They put a gun to his head. They threaten him, a bunch of other things. He figures, oh, this is it. And he's out of here. So he goes up to the United States. So uh, he gets kicked out of the United States, comes back, gets detained to be deported again. And he says, look, this is a convention against torture. I have amnesty claims. And this should be a reminder to everybody how impossible amnesty claims are. The court, the Bureau of uh, the Immigration Officer denied it. Then the uh, Immigration Court, quote unquote, denied it. Then the federal court denied it. And the Ninth Circuit denied it. And because, and this is amazing to me, they said, well, there might be someplace in Mexico they don't find you. So as long as there's someplace in Mexico they don't find you, you can't get amnesty in the United States, even if you have a proven record of persecution with the affiliation and association and acquiescence of local police, who, again, they didn't dispute any of his factual allegations at all. Didn't deny this was why it was what was happening. There's a guy who was not looking for work in the U.S., was happy to sell religious keychains around the, and was apparently good at it, so good he drew the attention of the cartels. You have to be good at it to draw the attention of the cartels. And so, uh, and the idea that the cart, and it's the federal courts in denial, that half of Mexico is currently run by cartels. I mean, you could argue the whole country is, but at least large parts of the country don't, don't even the local sheriff is a waste of time. It's the cartels that literally run it. And so I mean, they, I mean, they have military grade drone warfare capability, the cartels. That's the level they've reached in large parts of Sonola and other parts of Mexico. Uh, and so the idea that he should be deported, of all the people that should be deported, we got hardcore criminals, gangbangers, actual cartel members, rapists, pedos. They're not getting deported. But this guy that's got a legitimate amnesty claim is, is getting deported. S some people might say that this looks like the, 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 the individual was Christian. It's not, he was not. Um, no, yeah, 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 Catholic. So, so, 
Catholic, some might say that this is a continue continuation of the declaration of war on on religion, Christianity in particular. The, the, but the court said you didn't challenge the idea that you could move to another place in Mexico, and you didn't challenge the idea that this well, was not. He said, a, "Well, he did. He just said, uh, he said, look, I they keep finding me wherever I go, so I'm sure there's going to be some part where they find me." And the court's like, "Well, you don't know until you try." I mean, that was their excuse for not challenging. Until you tried every single part of Mexico, you now have no am amnesty. You got to be the dead other, before you the get other, amnesty in the U.S. The, the other absurdity was that they, I think they said that the two incidents of violence was not sufficient evidence of persecution. Oh, it was not torture. It yeah, was not you torture. Were beaten, you were beaten badly. They put a gun to your head. Okay, big deal. I mean, th th this. I mean, and by the way, this happens all the time. It is almost impossible. For those people out there on the right that think everybody gets amnesty all the time, hogwash. Legitimate amnesty people get denied all the time. They almost mm. never grant amnesty requests, no matter how much you prove. But this was one of the more egregious ones, because usually they're at least trying to contest the evidence, contest the claims. They didn't contest any of it. And they were, and what's that's what made it shocking. It's like, okay, if you're basically the victim of cartel violence with the acquiescence of police, uh, and you know that you're likely to be again, screw you, because maybe you can find somewhere in the world they won't kill you. You just don't get to come to the United States. And the whole point of amnesty is, yes, we do grant amnesty in those instances. And again, this is not, this is, if this was 100 million people that had this claim, a different animal. You know, there's not that many people that have the kind of detail this guy does. All right, what's the Iran, what's the Iran political prisoner case? Ah, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll go there, and then we'll save the UFOs the Newberg and, case, Nigel and the Farage, debanking, and Facebook files, exclusive for locals. Uh, the uh, yeah, the Iran political prisoner case is fascinating. So people may have heard about this guy briefly, a guy that went on, went to a conference, got arrested in Iran as a spy, and was there for four years until he was released. Tortured, starved, all the joys of being in an Iranian prison. This is what my friends on the left, I don't understand. It's like anybody that's anti-American, they, they end up being for. So, you know, they're for Hamas because they're anti-American. Uh, uh, they're for China because they're not America. Uh, you know, uh, for Iran because they're not America. For Cuba or Venezuela because they're not, you know, you're, Blacks, Blum, you're Max Blumenthal's of the world. Like they, Max Blumenthal and Aaron Mate got all on their high horse uh, because, uh Shock, shock, Bobby Kennedy Jr. has the same politics as his father and his uncle, uh, which is that he's pro-Israel and not pro-Iran. Uh, you know, I mean, you don't have to be, a, if you followed him or you'd followed his father, or his, that would not surprise you at all. But it shocked them because they're like, oh, if you're anti-war and you're anti-empire and you're anti-deep state, then naturally you should side with Hamas. Uh, naturally you should side with the PLO. I mean, where do these people's brains work? Glenn Greenwald's always shocked by this. Like, how can people do that? Probably for the same reason you're never going to go to Hamas-occupied territory by yourself, Glenn. Probably because you would be terrified to do it. Because they would take you to the top of the roof, throw you off, and murder you just for the fun of it. And that's where the hypocrisy, the fraud of the Aaron Mates, the Max Blumenthal's, the Glenn Greenwald's on this issue is embarrassing. Quit living in denial. Robert Kennedy Jr. just ain't in the same denial you folks are. Uh, but the you know, Iranian prisons are brutal. So this, but here's what it exposed. The lawsuit exposes how the deep state really operates. So this guy comes back. He's a shell of a man. He files suit against his own company. And here's why. His company sent him to Iran without telling him that they were uh, a State Department paid operation that uh, was known within Iran to be basically a spook run organization meant to infiltrate the women's movement in Iran. What's interesting here, too, remember the women's movement protest? Mm -hmm. And remember the allegations by Iranian, Iran that a large part of it was foreign spook sponsored? Well, yes, it was. Now, that doesn't mean there's no women that don't have reason to protest in Iran. That's I mean, that's where the Alexander and the Dur Duran agreed with me. You could both have a bunch of Western inspired operatives in the women's rev revolt in Iran and understand that a lot of women don't like living under radical Islamic fundamentalism, which tries to strip them of their humanity. 
Uh, my friends on the left just can't, they can't put those two together somehow. Uh, Caitlin Johnston of the world, who pretend to be the only independent people when they're the least independent people of the world. Uh, the, the, the blindness about radical Islamic fundamentalism is among, on the left is mind boggling to me. Didn't exist in the 1990s. It was, it was an anti-George W. Bush reaction. He used it, so that must mean it's no longer a threat to the world. Uh, there's a reason you don't hang out there, folks. There's a reason ain't none of you going to have your next... I can't wait for my vacation to PLO territory. Can't wait for that special tour guide. Uh, I always wanted to be randomly kidnapped. Uh, you know, the uh, just extraordinary. But so this guy, what happened is this guy got suckered. So this is how a lot of these operations really work. So the State Department will pay a uh, independent third party contractor who will in turn hire a non-governmental organization. Sometimes they call them NGOs. Uh, these these so-called charities, many of which are in disguise, something else. And they will send, and then they will go out and hire people who are completely unwitting because the best spy is a person who doesn't even know they are acting as one. Get that person, recruit that person, and say, "Hey, we want you to go to this women's conference in Iran." By the way, oh, Bobby wouldn't have taken that bait. And they're like, "Iran? I don't think so. No, no. It's like people keep trying to get me to go to Dubai and other places. I ain't, you know, I get some of the, the countries are okay, uh, as long as Islamic fundamentalism is strong there. I'm skipping it." Uh, no, no touring. The, uh, but, you know, this guy doesn't know anybody. He's looking for economic opportunity. They say, hey, we want you to go to this conference. We want you to meet with some women's groups. We're going to help give them some technology they can use to spread their message. Not we're going to give you give them technology to circumvent the Iranian government's ability to know that they're sponsoring and planning a revolution in the country. Um, the, and so he goes there, goes to the conference, shares this information, has no security, no security protocol, no security plan. Uh, he's in a taxi cab, doesn't even have his own car. And on his way back to the airport, the uh, famous Iranian rev revolutionary guard. I know some people cried about when the head of that guy sat killed by Trump. I was not one of those people. That guy had common sense. I was done was Sunday. Uh, but pick him up, detain him, arrest him, torture him for four years, finally release him because the guy never was a, a knowing spy at all. I mean, the, the Iranian court system is a complete crock. Their whole government's a complete crock. Uh, anybody that defends them is, is a nitwit. Uh, God bless them. Uh, there's plenty of people on the left that do it, but you know, that doesn't mean I want to go to war with them. People can understand the difference between the two. But he finally comes back. He sues. And what do you think they claim? They're like, hey, we were acting at the behest of the State Department. This is an old uh, deep state immunity, otherwise known as sovereign immunity. And the law for sovereign immunity for a private contractor is, first, it's not a jurisdictional defense. It's only a, uh, it's a affirmative defense. And so it's like qualified immunity for cops. So it's something on summary judgment to be reached after all the discovery and the evidence is presented. But what it is, is if you are a contractor acting, it, 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 uh, it's more limited than agency law. So for those people that remember agency law, the principal can be held responsible for an agent under a lot of areas that's broader than sovereign immunity applies to a private contract. Sovereign immunity only applies to a private contractor when the principal actually authorized the private contractor, when the government actually authorized them, directed them, stripped them of any discretion to act on their own accord, and they had legal authority to do all of it. That was in dispute because, in fact, the State Department was more wink, wink, nod, nod, never told the company what they should do to sucker people to go over there as unknowing, unwitting spies. Um, and so his lawsuit against that company for intentional infliction of emotional distress and subjecting himself to this risk, they knew about the risk because they had told the State Department when they asked for a bunch of money to help do this, by the way, we can't send our own people because they'll probably end up in prison or tortured or whacked or worse. Uh, so we're going to sucker somebody else to go instead. Uh, I mean, that's, but it tells you how, how deep the deep state goes. How many people are yeah. operating as spies who don't even realize they're operating as spies? That's, that's fact. I mean, that sounds like a Jean, Jean Le Carré novel, Robert. I, I, try, I tried to listen to The Constant Gardener. I got real bored. It was a 14-hour book, so I just read the synopsis and skipped to the end. I got the gist Which of always it. reminds me of a terrible, terrible joke. The, uh, uh, I was actually at a party and, a, uh, uh, and someone I didn't know came up and she was like, oh man, I was just going to see this play and I got about a third of the way in and I realized it was about the Holocaust. And I was like, oh, I know how this ends. 
<laughs> oh, wait, that's that's the joke. Yeah, yeah. It was as soon as she said, I just she's like, I'm gonna be so bored. I gotta get out well, of here. <laughs> I was like, oh, my. I was like, yeah, right, well, be careful who you tell that joke with. <laughs> Um, all right, Robert. So we're gonna we're gonna finish this up. I might have to. I'm gonna go reaction. until I get in trouble. Uh, I'm gonna give the link to locals in our Rumble community. Everybody, if you're gonna come over, come on over. You can become a member. There's no cost to that. Yeah, Hit the plus ask button. Five dollar tips. Uh, we'll definitely answer it either today or tomorrow. And then, uh, we'll cover UFOs, the Newberg Four, the first real big January six style entrapment. Uh, but done of oh, so-called terrorists. It's so good that decision. Nigel Farage mm -hmm. and the Facebook files. Uh, what I was going to say, I've been told to remind everyone on Rumble, download the app uh, and then turn on notifications. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. That's the best way to never miss an episode and not get notifications too late. And hit the, the, hit uh, the Rumble like version of the Rumble like button. Oh, yes. And, and before we go over to, to locals, hold on one second. There was just this right here. Bushakalaka. We got I Care 22 Great content. To info support you both smoking british columbia canada outdoor organic homegrown now gift what is this okay oh that you both are awesome have followed since covid fleet lord avatar reminding people to push the thumbs up for leadership board on rumble crazy guru what states does ken barnes practice law in we need more of him and that is uh rumble rants on rumble okay everyone on rumble thank you very much go enjoy the evening but before you do that come on over to viva barnes law.locals.com you got the link and you're going to want to hear the entrapment uh, decision and the um, Facebook government coercion ending on Rumble in five, four, three. Now, let's just make sure I've done it. Have we done it? Refresh. Replay is being prepared. Okay, good. Robert, don't be mad at me if I, I'm going to go until my wife comes in and says we've got to go for dinner. But let's um, we'll do the it, chats. It, if it is your anniversary. What, what is it, the event? No, it's my kids. It's my kid's birthday, and we're going to go to a, a oh, which Dave one? Bus, uh, the uh, the middle one. So the we got July, ah, all three, go all David three, Buster's. I th David Buster's or the other one that's the same type of place. Ah, uh, with uh, the Chuck games, e. Chuck E. Cheese, Chuck E. Cheese. So we're going to see which Chuck one we e. get Cheese. to. It's, you know, they're making uh, a horror movie that's loosely based on a Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll make a comedy called "The Dad Who Has No Shame in Kicking His Kids' Butts at All the Games." Um, okay, Robert, which one? Uh, we we should do the we should do the entrapment first. What do you want to start uh, with? I mean, I don't have a lot of deets about the UFO thinking, but I know if you had any particular thoughts on the UFO uh, whistleblowers. No, I, th I, I, I think it's it's all a distraction. This is a bona fide, genuine distraction. When I'm starting to get notifications from uh, CBS or NBC, or whichever one it is, in YouTube, uh, non-human biologics found, I, I, I've never really bought into the distraction argument. It's no, it's a no-brainer. It's bullshit. The timing it's just seems too weird. Timing the I mean, detail. the whistleblower guy seems legit, so maybe his testimony may still be legit. The timing of Congress holding the hearings maybe to distract. But his, his but the information might still be real. True, but he he seems also. I mean, like Richard Ferris has... was on with the body language panel. I he I have no doubt he saw a UFO. Do you know well, anyone I, has seen one? Mark no, Robert uh, seen one. I know people who said they've seen one, and I have no doubt that Richard Barris. Well, they said of the third kind, which means that they had a, they had a, an experience in which the unidentified object interacted with their environment. So they had a close one. Um, yeah. I, 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 I believe in it. Actually says they've seen aliens? No, I, I had a neighbor who said that UFO, she, got, right? she... No, I said a neighbor who said she got struck by lightning multiple times, and I thought that, you know, that was an indication of something. Um, no, I, I also... But I listened to the whistleblower. I just... Uh, there's a lot of him saying what other people with direct knowledge are saying. So... I, I, I'm not. I'm not sold on it. I do believe in. I think you'd have to be. It would be silly not to think that there would be life somewhere out in the infinite right. universe. It would be terrifying to think that there isn't. I'm not sold on this whistleblower, and I'm especially cynical about the timing and the detail that they're going into right now. But the entrapment case, Robert, of the, 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 the judge is destroying. Now I, I'm getting confused on the details again. Then give us the details and refresh Bronx, my memory. The Bronx honest. terrorism plot. Might oh, the Bronx theory. terrorism plot. Yeah, that's that's. Robert, like once you know that the FBI sets up plots to foil plots, you can never look at anything ever again uh, with the same with the same view. G give us the details on this because I'm going to try to pull up some some of the key um, quotes from the decision. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, and this was happening all the time in, in pretty much almost every case after 9/11 of a terrorism plot exposed. 
when you dug in, and, and here, you know, I was just critical of Glenn Greenwald on, you know, Israel and Iran, but here, I mean, but Glenn Greenwald otherwise does great work. Uh, same with Aaron Mate, did great work on Syria and other aspects. Max Blumenthal has done some good work on the Ukrainian conflict. Uh, disagree with him on cer certain things, but uh, uh, Glenn Green Greenwald is one of the best people uh, constantly reporting that these 9-11 terrorism cases were bogus. And mm -hmm. he was having the guts to do it at the time. Uh, many conservatives took hook, line, for, and sinker. Like when some of them wonder, how do they think they're going to get away with the Whitmer entrapment plot? Or how do they think they're going to get away with not getting ever exposed on January 6th? It's because conservatives cheered them for a decade, actually decades, uh, but cheered them for over a decade just concerning post 9-11 plots that were right out of the show 24. And here's your typical 9-11 prosecution. Some ne'er-do-well, low-level criminal gets convinced by a high-level informant to plot something crazy and insane that they don't have the means to do, the tools to do, the skills to do, or any predisposition to do. That, the, it's the predisposition that they never had any intents to do. So they get their they get their FBI informant to go into a place where you have call them vulnerable. People might object to the idea of referring to adults as vulnerable, but you know, low income uh, r religious people who could be easily manipulated or in this case, not so easily manipulated. It took months and months and months to finally get the person to go along with anything, promise them money, give them money coming from the, the informant who goes in and finds, not, I don't know if the word is a lackey, um, but goes what the judge said, these are vulnerable people who are exploited and duped into criminality and then slapped with the most excessive sentences conceivable where they would have never even embarked on the notion they were just religious people who were there to pray. Oh, yeah. I mean, made what made they for did, TV they, movie. They generally were not. They were like low IQ folks, not very bright, on the margins of society, often economically desperate, and sometimes a little crazy. And they get a combination of those people. And like what they do is they, the FBI finds a high level informant, a very persuasive guy. In this case, they had a Pakistani lifetime criminal who they let off the hook for all kinds of crazy, serious crimes during this whole time period. Not only that, uh, they, uh, I mean, kind of like Whitey Bulger, uh, it, it, at least the allegation was. It turns out Whitey mm -hmm. Bulger may have been an unknowing I informant. In other words, that he didn't know that the feds were actually protecting him in certain ways. But this guy did. Uh, and he was paid over $100,000. So not only does he get immunity to commit to for all the crimes he's previously committed, gets immunity for all the crimes he's currently committing, he gets his pocket lined with over a hundred grand in cold hard cash that's actually reported. Usually there's always unreported black bo box budgets that are not even covered here. And he finds the most the, the most vulnerable, most susceptible, most gullible people. Goes to mosques. Who's the loser here? Because your hardcore terrorist isn't going to hang out with some criminal schmuck they just met. Right? That's not who he's able or capable of infiltrating. The FBI was pretending that's what they're infiltrating. It never was. And so they had to make it out to look that way. So this guy, and what they would do is the infiltrator would find some schmucks. The feds would come up with like the craziest, weirdest plots. So like this one said, okay, we're going to take stinger missiles and we're going to shoot US air, US military planes out of the sky. It's like, why that exactly? That, you know, in, in the US, I mean, as terrorism goes, not, not, not anything special, really. Um, uh, but they're doing it for certain jurisdictional reasons, by the way, uh, that triggers certain federal jurisdiction and certain federal criminal laws. That, I mean, that's a giveaway that it's not a legit independent plot, that they're targeting something you would only target to enhance your criminal sentencing exposure. Mm -hmm. It's not like the terrorists go there, okay, let's go to the sentence guidelines. Okay, if we do it with this weapon at this place to this people, then we can get the maximum sentence. I mean, that was the huge giveaway. It was all crap. And he found some of the most, uh, they, uh, he offered a quarter of a million dollars, huge amounts of money to these people, played off any prejudice or mental illness that they had, told them that they were going to change the world and create, in you know, fake bombings of a couple of synagogues and fake stingrays. Uh, by the way, anybody that was familiar with actual bombs would have known they were fake bombs. I mean, that's why they were fake plots. They're, and the feds made them up. The feds went out and created them, generated them, incentivized them, uh, and and executed them. Uh, I mean, they just keep doing Operation Northwoods over and over and over again. 
And they and almost every single so-called terrorist in prison for decades since 9-11 is one of these nitwits, idiots, crazies, kooks, suckers, or vulnerable losers. Mm-hmm. Um, ju- and that's and they just took the same map uh, template, used it on Whitmer's case, and used it on January 6th. They find the most susceptible, most vulnerable, uh, most gullible. Uh, populations and get them to commit crimes that never would have happened but for the FBI. And to the credit of the court, the court released three of the four. This has gone up on appeal. Gives you an idea how tough entrapment cases are. Second Circuit said, no, this isn't entrapment. Uh, it's, still, it's not entrapment. It's like, oh, and there's absolutely no evidence they had a predisposition for this. Oh, uh, well, we're going to change the entrap. Basically, unless they put a gun to your head and force you to do it, entrapment law doesn't mean anything in federal court anymore. Uh, because God forbid the, the the federal government not have all the power. And by the way, the worst judges on these are so-called constitutional conservatives uh, who don't care one iota about the Constitution if it means a criminal defendant or if it means a so alleged terrorist. Then they suddenly forget about that Constitution they supposedly care about so deeply and honestly and only ones to do so. Um, and But to the credit of this judge, district court judge, Released them on compa- after a decade plus in prison. Released yeah. them on a uh, compassionate release. It, the, the 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 judge it was eviscerated. up to DeSantis that this wouldn't happen because he wants to take away these laws. By the way, that dimwit, you know, he's back to his old school federal prosecutor days, and, and you know the uh, and he's out there saying that Trump's first steps act was terrible, bad reform. Uh, you know, we got to we got to got to send them all to prison. These were the kind of people DeSantis's pals were sending to prison. What I found amazing, first of all, the judge eviscerated the FBI. It called it a, a made-for-TV setup um, and said, you know, they, they, they have to be punished for the crimes that they did commit, but it was the specific, you know, the specific type of the crime that they knew would get terrorist enhancement charges or terrorism charges. Uh, it, it was, it's, it's a joke. I mean, they, then they spent over a decade in prison, but for the FBI's involvement in orchestrating this, it never would have happened. It never would have existed in the first place. But the FBI gets to say they foiled a plot that they set up themselves. So, yeah, it's it's, oh, it's was, a trope. This was the Bronx terrorism plot. There was massive news about it, and there were basically a half a dozen of these. And, and conservatives were the ones that take. I, I don't just ate it and ran with it for a decade. I don't remember. I don't think I swallowed it up. I just. It would never. It would never have crossed my mind that this was the reality back in the day. I yeah. remember hearing stories, and you know, everyone felt safe then. And now you, now you know, you felt safe uh, because the it's, the I mean, criminals. What they were- did is they just changed who the audience was and changed the script. So they took what was anti-terrorism targeted to a conservative audience, and said, "Now let's make it domestic terrorism targeted to a liberal audience." And now liberals, the same same liberals that complained about these cases, every January six type case. All those domestic terrorists, they're out there. I'm like, oh my goodness. How dumb can you be? Robert, I hear footsteps. Before I get summoned out, and, and if ah, you don't, I mean, we you don't. Briefly, yeah, debanking, Let's... Nigel Farage fought back and won, got the bank CEO kicked, and they're now recommending legislation in the UK that congressmen and senators need to be doing, state legislatures need to be doing now, which Absolutely. is you should have a right to your bank account. Robert Kennedy said it's like a utility. There should be no political discrimination allowed by any federally insured bank. That needs I don't to know happen they, in, in lending and in, in, in borrowing and in investing and in co-partnering and customer accounts, IRAs, 401ks, all of it. No more political prejudice should be allowed by a federally insured institution. And so for the, and for those who don't know, Nigel Farage, you know, randomly, unilaterally, capriciously debanked, no notice, no explanation given. Uh, and I think friends and family, like uh, uh, tons of people debanked. And I forget, I think somewhere they mentioned a number, they, they ultimately elucidated some of the reasons and it had to do with positions over Brexit and other things that, that banking is not an essential service utility, essential service in the actual meaning of the word. Uh, is atrocious. I, I have been told that in Canada, it was an essential service until 2022 and a law changed that. I've got to independently verify that because I don't know that's true and I haven't really found anything after a summary uh, you know, re- search, but it's a no-brainer. So Nigel Farage was debanked. I don't know that he was, re- was he reinstated? About, above and beyond getting the people at the Coots Institution in trouble, has he been reinstated yet? I, mean, I, I, I believe so. Uh, okay. The But he's starting a petition and he's having all kinds of people file their claims. 
I have a major case in the United States concerning this problem, uh, Qualiza versus the U.S. Yep. Bank, uh, based out of Minneapolis. Uh, and I give it as an example to people. It's like if they're willing to go after a guy like this. So, you know, Qualiza developed uh, urban development projects uh, using historic and new tax credits and state tax credits. And what does that mean? It means he went into poor and impoverished communities that used to be redlined by these big banks and created investments that actually revitalized these poor urban communities, provided jobs, improved property values, improved school quality, had all these knockoff effects. He did this in multiple places, New Orleans, and this last one was in St. Louis, one of the toughest communities in St. Louis. And US, and he had made in the process over two decades, U.S. Bank, he had done a half a billion dollars worth of deals and had made them more than $50 million in cash for them, their customers and their clients and their VIPs. And they got politically weaponized the Community Development Corporation, which after our suit got public, they changed the name of, by the way. It's now Impact Finance. Suddenly, it's no, it's no longer. They don't want anybody thinking it's the same organization of all these wacky wokesters who took over the organization, weaponized it, designed it to make him bankrupt. Basically, tried to ruin his entire life by every every bank trick you can imagine. They even deceived the hierarchy at U.S. Bank in Minneapolis into not knowing what's going on, into thinking one thing was going on when actually something else was going on. These people were going around to woke uh, events, radio, television, show hosts, conferences, special ceremony, award ceremonies, et cetera, telling everybody, we're going to weaponize our power to uh, serve the purposes of racial equity with R and E and, and, and capitalization. Probably many of these people are white that are doing this. Uh, but what they really meant was to promote the woke religion. And we're going to target people. And even though here you have a guy who's benefiting poor, doing more as much as anybody in the country to develop, to benefit poor urban African-American neighborhoods. And they're targeting him. Why? Because they found out he liked Donald Trump. Uh, and so they just tried to, to destroy him. We have a lawsuit pending in federal court concerning it. And it's an example that what ha happened to Nigel Farage has already been happening in the United States. And if they can debank you, it's the same as what a central bank digital currency could do with a social credit score. Mm -hmm. So that's why there has to be a right to bank without political prejudice uh, in the same way you have a right to the telephone, to a cable service, to internet access. We need to create a basic right to access to utilities without discrimination based on political bias. Well, it, it just makes no sense in that even convicted, hardened, violent, vicious criminals still have bank accounts. So the idea of unilaterally, capriciously, politically Well, that's what some of those banks are for, especially if uh, James Comey or Robert <laughs> Mueller sits to, is on the board, then you Epstein, really know that's what they're there Epstein had a, had a good bank account. And a very, exactly. A Epstein lot. never got debanked. Epstein <laughs> got rebanked and upbanked. Oh, my goodness. All right. And then, Robert, the, the never in writing... Always in cash, never in writing. It seems that uh, some idiots at Facebook did not adhere to this rule. By the way, we made a sale on a shirt. One sale. I posted that and uh, said, we have a shirt for that. Um, the Facebook uh, Twitter files, pretty. it's very damning. I, I said J Jim Jordan should not have been the one to release it because it, it looks partisan. It looks political and people can too easily ignore it, even though they would ignore it anyhow. But the black and white of the emails and pen and paper is there. And you got a Facebook employee circulating an email internally saying we're getting a lot of pressure from the Biden administration to censor information as relates to COVID. I mean, th the pending lawsuits there, you got uh, Stossel, you got RFK Jr. You got, I, think, I don't know where Candace Owens' lawsuit is. It might be no longer there. You got a number of uh, Donald Trump. You got a number of pending lawsuits that were arguing government uh, violation of constitutional rights on this very basis. Amendments, and this all goes in, is this, this is as egregious government coercion as you can imagine. Completely, yeah. I mean, you read through the files. And, and Robert Kennedy's file, uh, case, one of his cases, has now been transferred, I think, to the, Eastern, to the same district in Louisiana that's handling the other cases. So, that, so the, uh, the same judge, Judge Doty, has been good on a wide range of topics. So hopefully that's helpful. But, you know, Jim Jordan uh, laid out in, in my view, irrefutable detail that the allegations that Robert Kennedy first raised several years ago, 
that the federal courts ignored in California that is still pending before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, by the way. I think over a year, year and a half since oral argument, they're trying to figure out how to screw Robert Kennedy without looking like idiots and losers in the process. Um, because it's obvious what he was said was right. The, the government was coercing, wasn't just collusion, it was coercion. That as Mark Zuckerberg has now admitted, a bunch of stuff and a bunch of people and a bunch of information and a bu bunch of pages and posts were censored that never would have been but for the government. That uh, this was not the Facebook doing it on its own accord. Zuckerberg's admitted that much of what took place was not at Facebook's insistence. It was solely and wholly because of government demands and the threats that came behind those demands. Um, okay, Robert, I might, do you want to read the, the, do you want, I could, we could leave it going if you don't mind doing it solo, you could, we can do that. I or no I can, how to stop it. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry about that. I'll, well, what I'll do is I'm going to take myself out. You can bring yourself out and then I can remotely attempt to, um, to do it or yeah. It last it, forever. <laughs> well, it'll last for a couple hours maybe, but it'll be a black screen if you just remove yourself. Um, and then the chat can continue on. Are you good with that? That's fine by me. Okay. Let me see. Well, let's see if anyone, I got I hear noise, um, but uh, well, let's, we, okay. Do we have, we don't have any more subjects that we, we, we covered all of it. Yeah, right? no, just the questions now. Okay. Uh, so go, let's let, look okay, here. Hold on until I get in trouble. Hold on. Let me just, let me just double check here. One. I haven't heard anybody. <laughs> we'll see. The, the door will come busting down. I'll, I'll start from the bottom up. Uh, Eric. How old F. is he? Is he nine now? Uh, well, it's the girl. She's 10. So Ten. And, and then oh, and, they're all and, growing up. They're all going to be old. They're, gro they're going to be old, and we're they're going to be out of the house, and we're going to. Uh, we'll have a, a what is it called? A empty nest, and it'll be very depressing. Although, my goodness, yes, well, it, we have now also guests from Montreal that came down, so we've got a full house, and we're and, and the kids are still off school for another uh, uh, week and a half or something. School starts early here. Uh, Robert, we got Eric F. Ten dollar tip says it shouldn't be a right to banking. Right in quotes, it should be treating all financial services as utilities. I agree with that. Yeah, it's the uh, same basic principle. Dread Robert, one dollar tip says these FBI agents should serve the sentences of those they set up. <laughs> and let's just first have them get so sanctioned. I would say or... there's a good argument for a right to banking. Uh, the uh, the not a right in the sense that you, that even if you can't afford it. But uh, what a, a right to equal access. I, I think there's a good... It, can you survive in the modern age if uh, you, you can't have access to banking? I don't think you can. Well, that, if you uh, treat uh, as you... Richard Barrett, treat, well, I mean, not Richard Barrett. George Gammon was making that point recently. But I, I guess what's the difference between a utility and a right? Like, you, you can't well, deny... I mean, it effectively so functions similarly. But the to the degree that the people are saying that, well, we don't want uh, you to have a right to it, would imply the possibility of denial out of the gate to it. And I get people's concerns. They don't want things like saying you have a right to health care, so to speak. Um, and so I'm not saying that you should have a constitutional provision that says you have a right to bank, uh, a banking access. But the to the degree of the same right to any utility, in other words, that if you abide by certain rules, then they have to make it accessible to you. Uh, you know, the there's a lot of conservatives and libertarians that favor purely private utilities. And really don't believe in any restrictions on utilities. I don't agree with them. Certain things, public parks, certain, certain to me, monopoly power, internet access is now a utility. Uh, and banks that are federally insured are now a utility. You don't want to be federally insured. Okay, have do whatever you want. Different animal. Uh, but okay. you have almost no bank that is. Susie C says, missed you yesterday, Barnes. Great interview with Grobert. Thank you both. Karantov, $5, says, can we see RFK as attorney general in next Trump administration? Maybe make Barnes a special counsel. Can Viva, a Canadian, be made a special deputy? If I get if I get um, citizenship, I could run for governor of Florida. Right, Robert? Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, we got Karantov, I just read that one. Mandalici, $10 tip. If you are in your local Rotary and a United States citizen that believes in the U.S. Constitution. Okay, hold on. If you are in your local Rotary and a United States citizen that believes in the U.S. Constitution and the Second Amendment, you need to read the Universal Rotary Mission and then quit. 
USA Now, Vivek made his fortune selling hedge funds, the sleaziest part of the stock market. I think about think about that. Never mind being part of the pharma industry. Why so much trust for him? I don't trust anybody, but he's saying the right things now. I mean, he's saying the, the things that are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not voting for him for president, but I think he's putting some decent policy ideas out there. And we got Rhett like $5. Recently, Arkansas passed a law extending the statute of limitations for malpractice suits related to transgender treatments or surgery for minors. I believe they extended it for 15 years past the 18th birthday. That would be good. Uh, what do you think of this as an alternative to simply banning such surgeries? 15 years seems like a long time, but three years after me. I mean, I don't know why the original statute of limitations for, for, for <clears throat> prejudice. Would I mean, not be enough. for medical malpractice is so limited. I think the kind of uh, issue it is, they should have a longer statute of limitations because discovery is likely to take longer, but you don't want to have to litigate that in court. Discovery of injury is likely to take longer because, in other words, it may be someone when they're 25 or 30 says, I never should have gone through this procedure, but it's only something when they're 25 or 30 that's going to that's going to dawn on them, that they should be allowed to sue at that stage. All right, we got to Laney Mac, $5 tip. As a sexual assault advocate, I can tell you, Robert, is 100% correct. Mandalici, lewd and lucidious, lus lucidious, I think it's lucidious, lascivious behavior are part of every state's law. Fighting back against trans story hour is easy to do. Be brave. We got a meme here. It says, posted yesterday on the board, in your most convincing closing argument style, please read the attached meme. This will be better than when Robert Barnes says, tranny unless of course the chat says no there was once a man from nantucket to pass as a lady he'd tuck it when the chef saw his wand chef was found in a pond while her husband continued to do something to it okay i had never even thought of that as a possibility uh ryan pd 911 says barnes is finally wrong about something desantis is a dead dog no i don't want to say that but and must be i'm not saying that either his political career is over and i highly look forward to a true america first florida governor in 2026 mystic nice sent a two dollar tip have viva fry read the nantucket meme i'm going i'm we're going backwards here hi this is from rocky water hey viva barnes appreciate what you guys do question why is okay okay today instead of good good mr barnes <laughs> Bobby Barnes, Bobby Barnes, Bobby Barnes from Clout. Crispy Law says, I am long-haired Eugene Levy. That's me. Got Pasha Moyer. Uh, oh, gosh. This is a good meme here. Oh, God. I'm going to go ahead and save that and come back to it afterwards. Hold on. Screen grab. All right. And now oh, we're almost here. Tampered $5. Viva, can you interview? I'll screen grab this. Rex Radix Verum on her Michigan Whitmer cover-up. I'm going to I'm gonna try to try to do that. And we're at the last one, Robert. Robert Barnes, loved hearing how you and Viva met, but I need more as I currently live vicariously through these locals boards. What took place such that you and Viva decided to go into business together on this locals platform? I can feel that one. I, I think about you, you randomly suggested it out of the blue with the foresight of seeing what locals could be. And when I say that you always look out for my best interests, you said, can't rely on YouTube long-term. Can't can't have all your eggs in one basket. We can create a community that would be like a local tavern, a local coffee shop, a wonderful, beautiful community. I knew that Ruben was doing locals, but I, I was tunnel visioned in terms of like, you know, views, 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 YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. And then it blossomed into this amazing ikigai of an experiment that is, you know, the biggest blessing in my life, Robert. Seriously. Absolutely. All right. And that might be the best white pill way to end this before i get into some big trouble with the missus uh thank yeah, you all. A, i'll probably go live say happy birthday to the little one i will I, I hear them i hear them outside the door we're all we're coming we're coming okay robert what's your schedule for the week Do you have any appearances oh no no not this week gotta be but uh probably we'll be back uh with bourbons uh tomorrow tomorrow night okay excellent well, yeah, that's where we're. I'll I'll be going live. I'll do the Sanders stuff all week. I'll just see where I am, and uh, that's it. Robert, no time for our proper goodbyes afterwards. I got to get the heck out of here. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone in locals. Peace out, peeps.